Hello. I have recently had the genuine pleasure of spending time chatting with conceptual artist, sculptor, and world builder Johnny Fraser Allen. Over the course of his amazing career, Johnny has been part of the Weta Workshop, working on movies like Steven Spielberg's BFG, Peter Jackson's King Kong, and both versions of The Hobbit. In more recent times, Johnny has developed a fully formed and immersive fantasy world inspired by fairy, folk tales, Warhammer, and the work of Jim Henson. And let me tell you, this is an incredible world. During our fantastic conversation, Johnny and I talk about the design and model making effort that goes into crafting the greatest of fantasy movies, a lifetime spent in unparalleled world building immersion, and a load of hilarious stories as well. I'm Jordan, this is Jordan Sorcery, and today I have the privilege of being in conversation with Johnny Fraser Allen. Hi, Johnny. Thank you so much for joining me to talk to me about your career in film and in miniatures design and creation of, of games and stuff. I wonder Thanks, if you like... <laughs> it's a pleasure to, to be here. Sorry, I'm already talking of you. Um, <laughs> That's I, all right. I just, you've, uh, it's like being on my favourite TV show, really, because you, you're like the third main reason I use YouTube for now. You know, it's, um, it's the good thing about people like you. It's like you... Television shows would probably not fund or run a show that as a guy who doing a deep delve into, you know, the makings of games, but it's it's the only TV show I want to watch, you know, and, and so um, streaming your content while I'm designing for my next project and stuff like that. Um, I mean, I, I'd waited for ages for a deep dive into Hero Quest, which is how I discovered you. Basically, it's like, has someone done a, a making of Hero Quest yet? I need... I need some content while I'm drawing. And then that comes out, oh, who's this guy? You know? And then um and then man, you you you're prolific in, in what what you deliver um since you started, what only six months ago. And um but then what I'm really loving now, we talked a, a little bit about um before was um the interviews you're getting with um, you know, like people that to people like me uh are, are, are the rock stars, you know. Um uh and just just hearing creative people speak creatively while it's the best thing you can put on while you while you work while i work as a designer and um i mean the the 17 plus years i worked at weta um but if, if you go through new zealand for a gig or for a movie you always get taken through weta so and if you back in those days if you get taken through weta because every project you had to sign an nda and we couldn't show what was going to happen in avatar 4 or whatever's happening um richard would usually bring people to my desk because it was full of the gloaming which you didn't which was non-ip or warner brothers specific or whatever and and i was happy to talk to people but you know so we i i i've um i've had in-depth conversations about goblins with uh Beckham and Tom Cruise and Prince Charles but and it's like oh they're nice that that was cool but then the Perry brothers come through and it's um you know and you, you Beatles out over it and and they're coming through a place and they're seeing some of their heroes and then you know some punk kid is going the Berry twins you know and and um and that, that grew into an amazing experience where I went and, and stayed with them in Nottingham and that, they took me to Games Workshop for my first time many years ago and um Anyway, so I'm just saying, so watching the interview <laughs> that you've managed to collate on your channel is, um, is, is, uh, it's exactly the show that I've been waiting for. So thank you for um, providing <laughs> me with a whole bunch of content for me to design to. Well, thank you, Johnny. I mean, it sounds like I've, <laughs> I've requested you to introduce me at the start of the interview. So, well, that's very, very yeah. kind of you to say. But yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned there. A, a few things that I think we'll get into, right? So you you've had a fascinating career. You've worked at Weta. You've created the gloaming. You've done lots of really interesting stuff and worked with some really interesting people in some interesting places. What what was the sort of start of your journey with, I guess, art? Maybe let's start there, and then how you got into film from that. Well, the, yeah, the the two absolute um, 
pillars of what shaped me and create, created me and led me down an artistic w channel. But when I say artistic, everything to me, um, I didn't always know it was this, but now I've, the language I, I've learned to put around it is world building. And my fascination with world building came from, you know, the ages of five and six from the same source. And those two things were basically Labyrinth and Hero Quest. And my my older cousin, James, um, who I, I idolized, and he we, we grew up in Auckland, New Zealand, and he lived in Christchurch. And and the, he he wasn't even my cousin; he was mum and dad's best friend's son, sort of thing. But there was Auntie yeah. Sharon, Uncle George, and, and 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 cousin James. And it was always such a thrill to go and visit them, you know, because mum and dad had a great time with their best friends. And I'm hanging out with cousin James, and and when. When I was five, in the same night, he showed me Labyrinth and Dark Crystal taped off the television on VHS. And um, it just absolutely warped my brain. Um, it's funny, you know, like I, I had a great childhood. Uh, so I'm always fascinated at how desperately early on, I've, how obsessed I've always been with escapism. Like, my, you know, I wasn't running away from any horrible situation, but the fantasy worlds, like, you know, I grew up in the height of um of the action figure bonanza um and my obsessions were how i could get the full range of he-man or thundercats or dino riders or ninja turtles or toxic crusaders for some reason was a kid show but i i every day of my life i was physically holding a monster um really fantastically creatively designed monsters because it was adults jobs in america to come up with the most ridiculous next toy because this they keep selling more they've got to design more let's try if that works and so these monsters got more and more ridiculous to the point where you're actually making a cartoon show for kids out of toxic crusader <laughs> um or, or robocop and police academy and all these adult movies just so they could make toys and i was eating it up um but anyway yeah so a couple of years after labyrinth and dark crystal you know that you know you go back to cousin james's house and um he had a sega and um one of the other main inspirations for for the gloaming is the first level of um jurassic park and sega where you're alan grant and it's just that endless forest and you're going up and down the branches i just love that endless forest world but anyway then he introduced me to hero quest and i just like again the tactility i mean i don't need to explain to you or your viewers what makes hero quest so magical there's already 30 minute videos all over youtube because i could speak for an hour and 30 minutes of what that game does to me but it just the door it opened creatively because again this is before um youtube or streaming or, or we didn't have a game console or anything there was the fact that there was this tactile board game where one piece of cardboard that represented a door changed an entire landscape in your imagination and then when you replace that door with an open door and things started happening in that room with these beautiful models and the color palette and how well designed it was. And I hadn't discovered, you know, I'm, I'm seven or eight at this point. I hadn't discovered Lord of the Rings yet and, and what a huge part that would play in my life later on um, and, and how much time I've spent in Middle Earth now um, in my adult life and as a conceptual designer. But as a kid, my first introduction to orcs and goblins uh, was and, and and in some ways outside of the movie willow which i i would have seen before um hero quest but maybe that's possibly why hero quest absolutely captured me so much because i was already so obsessed with the movie willow but that sword and sorcery was it was so it, it grabbed me so instantly and and consumed me and i've never got sick of it it's only grown it's a, the parasite that that is fantasy <laughs> to me fully taken over the vessel you know but yeah. but yeah hero quick dark crystal absolutely but there's something i always say labyrinth when i say labyrinth i feel like i'm saying both of those movies then of course there's also jim henson storyteller which i feel is like the the third and that perfect jim henson creative triangle of of um the trinity i mean you know of absolute perfect has not been beaten since uh you know i i i still can't wrap my head around why uh why avatar is such a blockbuster and dark crystal didn't do well at the the cinema 
what 20 years prior to i'm not i don't know I'm, I'm not even saying i just like avatar but i just mean like they already they did it so much better with like puppets you know with that <laughs> pixels um but yeah anyway so but you know so i i guess again the key there is is world building like jim jim henson opened my mind to world building and then a couple years later after a couple years of obsession with fantasy and world building and and taking the, the only way i could really achieve that as a kid was um by trying to redraw ninja turtles or whatever but but i i could build my own worlds by having um skeletor interact with the ninja turtles or lion -O, um start fighting um the cobras and the gi joes inside my sylvanian mansion you know like I, I could create different worlds in my own movies with with physical tactile things while my drawing skills weren't were still d developing but then hero quest was this way of um i think that was my introduction to becoming an active participant in in the fantasy worlds that you got to be involved with mm. and and i i've really discovered that now in my adult life with um my current love for the game uh star wars legion because i i i, I love star wars more but basically as much as i do basically because it it's more fantasy than science fiction it's dungeons and dragons in space right and <laughs> and so i i still think of it as more fantasy than science fiction but anyway um and i i, I spent a lot of time making um terrain to play star wars legion and because everything has to be perfect because i'm i think i'm almost on the spectrum in terms of what i need on my tabletop but but what the what was i saying about star wars um oh yeah so when i'm a kid when i want to replicate the battle of hoth i've got one snow trooper my han solo is from return of the jedi not empire strikes back anyway you know i'm using the couch as echo base and once you set it up and go this is going to be my saturday you're still going pio pio oh i guess he's dead because there's no real rule system but but what what a game like star wars legion does it, it what makes me feel like such a big kid when i play it is now i can replicate basically the film you know i've got hundreds of miniatures on a table i've built echo base and there's a rule system so i don't feel like a total idiot just going no that one's dead bang bang and you know and now now there's also strategy to the play because it is play and we are playing with toys you can call them models or whatever but toys isn't a dirty word play isn't negative it's it's great that um it, which takes me back to to this one comment that i love and my the, the first big video i did with adam savage where i revealed my massive kind of hagglethorn hollow setup and in, in, in the studio that i'd spent all this time on and and like it's a video about adam savage a creative guy interviewing another creative guy's creative passion right so you know what you get when you click on that video and you watch it right yeah. and then um first came out i hadn't been on youtube before and i was just interested to see the people like haggleton hollow because i don't know and you know there's really positive comments and like oh that's really heartwarming oh everyone likes this oh the people but then there's just this one comment which was look at this man child this is what happens when your country hasn't had a decent war for 30 years and, and I loved it because it's like, and he he's saying that very negatively, but I'm like, yes, this is what happens when your country hasn't had a decent war for 30 years. Like you can have these men children celebrating, like all I do now for a living is what I tried to do and failed my entire childhood. Because when I tried to make, I, I, I tried to make the Ninja Turtle sewer playset out of cardboard and it was okay, but it was, it was a kid made a cardboard fort, you know? I tried to make Endor in the garden out of the, the trees we had in the backyard. And in my head, it was gonna be amazing. And I just always remember feeling like, oh, this kind of sucks. I, I had such bigger thoughts. And so I've spent my whole life finally getting to the point where I can create what I was trying to create when I was like seven or eight. That's incredible. And, and I, it's not me that I'm a big kid. And, and you know, I don't feel stupid for that. I'm quite happy. That Absolutely, I'm yeah. I mean, as you say, that passion and bringing it to life and being able to take all of these amazing inspirations and turn that into something brand new, I think that that is definitely something to be celebrated. And it's lovely that you can sort of take those kinds of uh, comments and, and draw from those the, the joy, like you're drawing joy from, from all the childhood experiences as well. So how did you go yeah. from playing with all of these toys then to to being able to express yourself through that art and through the sort of things that you were creating on the page well for, for, for many years um uh Witter workshop has a a tour and you can go through it and um 
to to supplement my wages because I would I took I stopped doing so much paid work at Weta to focus on the gloaming um, because I became obsessed with this passion project, um, but that wasn't uh, that wasn't driven by uh, me wanting to earn money because I was you know I was all I was broke all through my twenties and thirties because of basically the gloaming, um, and so um, Richard Taylor would the, who runs Weta set up the stage for people like me, young and th you don't need to be young, but, but you know enthusiastic employees he had that were doing their thing. Um, could sit on the stage and every 30 minutes the tour guide would end with like you know and this is one of uh this is one of the workers at Weta what are you working on Johnny you know and um sometimes I might be sculpting Hoggle for Alessio Cavatore or uh sometimes I'd be sculpting a Middle Earth guinea pig sculpture for Richard who's obsessed with guinea pigs and that's a whole that's a whole kettle of fish there um and a lot of the times I was sculpting gloaming stuff but anyway uh Nearly one person in every group of 30 would always say, oh, you've got a gift. And I'm sitting there smiling, wondering why that really annoyed me. Um, and, but, and, or, you know, and they'd ask me about it. And I had to kind of answer to that so many times that through talking about it out loud, I kind of really got to terms and figured out how I became an artist. And, and I don't personally believe in um, fate or a destiny or a, a higher power or you're born with a gift or anything. Um, and so I was, and so processing all of that, I, I, I kind of realized that, well, at, at the end of the day, um, growing up, you know, a, a chubby, asthmatic, flat footed, um, you know, kid, uh, you know, my older brother who, who grew up into, uh, you know, a human man sized body where I only was only ever going to be a halfling. Like, you know, when, when he went and played sports, it felt good and he scored the goal and people, you know, but sports for me was uncomfortable. I, no one ever passed me the ball. And it was, I was always a Saturday wasted where I should be watching X-Men or, or He-Man. It's like, I missed out what Wolverine did that week because I've got to be in the cold playing a game that I'm forced to play. So I hated sport, right? But, and so, and so that alone, just my physical build made me enjoy drawing at a table more than running around outside and because i did that more um i got better at it and the better i got the more people would say hey that's good johnny look at you know and um but that's part of it and then the other part of it is the fact that it's so tied to the fact that there is something in me uh, on the other side of this coin that um i mean because again my older brother um you know he grew up he he's he watches rugby games and he works at a bank and he's a, a normal dude he watched labyrinth and dark crystal the same night as i did and he was like yeah it was good whatever for me so okay my world's either over has just begun whatever like james showed him hero quest as well it's like what are these okay what what's a dwarf you know what i mean he, he's not interested so there is obviously something in me um that uh just was so drawn to the fantastical elements and and again like we didn't have a computer game console and um i wasn't a huge reader at that early stage of of childhood i didn't even know there was a world of fantasy books out there i, th I think my first experience with a kind of a fantasy book was tales from jabba's palace and and um that really got me actually reading more because it's like oh, it's like a, there's another Star Wars movie that I can have in my head because there's only three of them, you know, which is the way it should have stayed. No, but, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, and so um, I think the more I drew and the more I, the, the more I played, playing with toys and monsters was a way for me to world build and drawing was a way for me to world build. But um, and I, so I've drawn every day of my life. I don't think it was the first time I actually drew something and it felt like exactly what was in my head. And I thought, oh, I'm finally there. Hmm. Was I think I was about 21 and I was drawing my version of Dolores Umbridge, who was my favorite Harry Potter character, before before she was cast in a movie and it, and my vision of it was changed, you know? Hmm. Um, yeah. So I remember, I remember being 14, reading The Lord of the Rings and then seeing a little bit of the amazing Ralph Bakshi animation. And um, in my head, like the 
uh, I'd kind of cast Aragon as Timothy Dalton, but now he was always voiced as John Hurt, which isn't a bad thing because it's the best voice ever. But I was always, a, so I was desperately trying to read the book before my percep because my perception of it was altered by someone else's vision of what Lord of the Rings was. And that kind of experience has been across the board a lot of the time with my designing experience. Um, like I just, um, I designed all of the uh, goblins and creatures and magics for Jim Henson's portable door recently. And they sent me the script, but I, I didn't read it. Um, I didn't, because one, I hate spoilers and I wanted to enjoy the movie. Um, and and two, it's like, uh, you know, I, I, I feel like I was hired because of what I think goblins should look like, you know? And I didn't, I kind of didn't really want any notes from the script, you know? And, um, and, and I, I felt more liberated for that. And I, I felt I'd kind of reached a point in my life and my career where I didn't really need to read the script. And I'm, I'm there as a conceptual designer and, and the, the script is for the actors and the production designer and, and, and not me. Um, but then there's other cases when I was working on Steven Spielberg's BFG, where um, it was amazing. The um, my concept of Mark Rylance as the BFG is the one Spielberg chose, right? And so, like, it, like if you look at that situation externally, you know, if 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 you told eight year old Johnny who walked out of Hook and told it for his eight year old birthday party and told all of his friends that one day I'm going to work for Spielberg, if you told that kid that he designed the title character for a fantasy Spielberg movie he'd implode like the house and poltergeist, you know, <laughs> but, but the reality of the situation is you find out that in a note in an email and you never really interact with, with Spielberg. Mm. Um, you know what I mean? But, but yeah. then, you know, I, I've also watched because it was on the, the server. I watched a, a meeting with Weta Digital where he was saying, no, 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 no. You stop straying off it. It's got to look exactly like this illustration. And he's never saying has to look like Johnny's illustration or I love this kid's work or whatever. He, mm. For him, it's just a drawing. I'll never meet him. He, if I did, he wouldn't know who I was. But uh, you know, but at the same same time, it's like, well, I designed the BFG, but that's not what it's like. Yeah. And and I think in some ways there's something lost. Um, and that that's not at the fault of Weta either. That's just you know whether was a guns for hire by whatever studio blah 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 they have this many people on the team everyone kind of designed different giants i designed um and everyone's putting in designs for all the giants and some, some one of them's got to get chosen um i like flesh lump eater who is the main bad guy in that movie i designed as a maid masher concept based on tom waits and um spielberg chose that one to be the main giant and then i had to redesign it a little bit when um uh Jermaine Clement got cast because of, he needed to have kind of gooier fatter lips like Jermaine Clement and stuff so little little things happen like that but the, the design journey is is different with um every director I don't know how I got on this tangent no it's interesting but, so, so mechanically then how do you are you just given a brief then so like for the portable door they would just say right we need 20 different goblin designs we need something that looks like this something that looks like that and you just it's always different so i wasn't even i wasn't even a film designer anymore when portable door came along in fact um working on alicia calvatore's uh labyrinth board game kind of got opened the door to portable door for me um if you will jordan um <laughs> b b because um also um that's that's another thing well hold on i'll keep spiraling around uh, um I can't keep one thought on my brain all the time, but um, uh, so my my dear friend Steve Boyle was hired uh, as the makeup designer for Portable Door, and um, he's the genius that worked on Black Sheep and Under the Mountain. He does all the makeups for the Spirit Brothers movie, like that one where uh, Daybreakers, where Willem Dafoe and um, Uma Thurman's husband Ethan Hawke, sure, uh, vampires, yeah, you know, and, and yeah, they all. They all, so he's an amazing makeup artist does this amazing stuff and we had a couple months working together on miniatures and king kong i i had two years on king kong but there was a couple months where he was in the miniature department with me and you know we just got on famously and um and there was so many years ago and we've always talked about working on a project since and then um and then um 
so he get, he gets this gig and so i designed no i had sculpted all of the miniatures and designed all of the illustrations for the jim henson labyrinth board game for alicia which is a whole other story um and jim formanac who was running the the licensing department of henson's at that time um i got on really well with him um and um there was this tv show that i guess i can't really talk about that jim henson's put together and he said they tried a couple of designers and it hadn't worked and so he said why don't we try johnny fraser allen and so he asked me all of so i, I spent a couple of months designing every creature in a tv show for the jim henson company like to a storyteller level um and i couldn't believe it but then like honestly uh, three of every four projects i've ever worked on in 20 years kind of get shelved you know like i don't know if it was a year or more i can't remember how long we spent on Guillermo del toro's hobbit the best creative work i've ever done in my life and i would legally never be able to show anyone you know but and so this was just one of those projects that got um shelved but when it came time to portable door henson's knew of my diligent excitable creature work and um steve boyle was also head of the creature shop and and they uh, they approached me to do the job and and i'm like the set the, the best movie the the best creative the best feat of creative imagination ever put onto cinema is the movie labyrinth right the second best movie ever made is jurassic park and you want me to turn sam neill into a goblin and pay me to do it i'm like <laughs> yeah that sounds like a career highlight i'm gonna i'm gonna take that gig and um, this was over two years ago. And I, I, I'm not kidding. I'm still suffering quite badly from RSI because um, I was working seven days a week, 16 hour days, not because they asked me to, but because everything I did, this, the, the director of it, Jeffrey Walker, second, no, first equal best director I've ever worked with next to Guillermo, that he really knows how to work with an artist. He was so um, ex excited and passionate made sure I was involved in all the production meetings and, and knew everyone and was so engaging. But he also just like, it was one of these things. It was very much like working with Guillermo in the sense that like anything I did is like, that's oh, it's great, man. It's, a, it's in the, it's in the film. And so the more I did, the more approvals I got. And he just, it just brought out the best in me. And I couldn't like, I couldn't give enough of myself to the project. And so I started ignoring all the signs of like, like, you know like the little piano strings going ping 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 in my wrist and um, i'm still recovering from it but it's it's not a complaint that's just a uh, illustrating how exciting it was when you work on the right projects um and it's nice to know like because any job can become a job like a like um you know like I, I remember getting bored sometimes working on tintin thinking johnny you're one of the five lead kind of designers on a spielberg movie but like i was always an asterisk guy my brother was tinted you know anyway but it's like a job can still become a, a job but it's nice that when a, when one comes along that you're thrilled about like it's nice to know that i haven't it, the industry hasn't killed that part of me yet it's come close <laughs> you know like um especially uh running the the tabletop gaming business side of things now that i've left film it's um it's so much work and it's, 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 it's a lot of pressure. And just the other day I was complaining to Stacy at how old I was looking because of it. And and then last night we were watching the professor and the madman, which has like Mel Gibson and as an elderly um, Oxford professor. And she's like, yeah, say so you look, you look like that. I'm like, Stacy, that's a 70 year old lifelong alcoholic. It's like, I'm not even in my forties yet. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah but you know if it was if it was easy everyone would be doing it you know as they say <laughs> yeah i mean i imagine it is an incredible amount of work and you mentioned sort of giving yourself to that project and how much you have to invest in a project you also mentioned there the the guillermo del toro the hobbit so because you worked on both versions of of that set of movies right so you were working on the del toro version and then onto the the subscription and, and then on peter's yeah, well, I mean, I guess it goes back to the question I still haven't answered because of all my tangents of how I kind of got there. Um, so I, um, at 14, I discovered Tolkien and I was, and, um, and which was around the same age, um, 
I mean, I, I knew of HeroQuest from being a kid, but when I was about 15, uh, a girlfriend gave me a mint copy of HeroQuest for my birthday. Um, Cause this was before eBay or internet shopping. I couldn't find it, right? But she'd won it from a, the library as a kid. And she was like, I don't want to play this crap. Do you want this game? And I'm like, do you know what this is? And she's like, no, that's why I'm giving it to you. I'm like, I couldn't believe I was getting this mint copy of HeroQuest. And it changed me. And it's the first time I painted miniatures. And that was that was my gateway drug into uh, Warhammer because I needed more of that plastic crack. And that was back when Warhammer still looked very much like HeroQuest. I mean, I still love the look of those orcs. And I could buy more plastic orcs and paint those up. And then um, that's what got me into making scenery. But I didn't, well, there weren't YouTube channels like mine or yours or, or, or people um, making fantastic content um I, I had a couple pictures out of the couple of white dwarves that i could afford and like how do i make that and i had to guess how i made it you know and so i made pretty crappy terrain but then i shoot movies with that terrain because as a teenager i made movies in high school and stuff and a lot of that terrain went into my folio to get into weta and and even though it wasn't great because i was multidisciplined and interested in making terrain i got my job i was applying for a conceptual designer hmm. um but, you know, because I was, I'll get to that in a sec. I'm just trying to do it in order, right? Sure. And so I'm 14, I discovered Tolkien, um, and I was at an all-boys Catholic secondary school in New Zealand, which is another way of saying prison. And I was the only kid at school reading Lord of the Rings. And and this was before the films. And obviously, Lord of, Lord of the Rings was a big thing, but I didn't know anybody that knew about it. And I really felt like it was my thing which is ridiculous now but as a teenager when you have your thing it's so important to you you know um and it really felt like my thing and i i, I um smoke free which are like a a branch of new zealand that pay to kind of make smoking look bad which as they should which is great um paid my school to pay an artist to paint a smoke free mural so I'll, it's still there to this day um 30 years later or whatever but I painted the massive wall on the school of all my favorite um, Tolkien characters smoking a pipe. And I just painted the habit under it, but it actually looks like a promotion for smoking. But anyway, so um, but I set my dog out. Um, right. Um, anyway, so like obsessed, obsessed with Lord of the Rings and everything. And then like, with, with, and then one day I'm like 15 or 16 and, and dad brings home the newspaper and it says, um, and obviously I was familiar with Peter Jackson because I wanted to be a director because in my head, but I was obsessed with world building and I didn't know that I, I didn't know to call it world building yet. Right. But I thought the high, the highest thing, the pinnacle of world building was being a director was being a Steven Spielberg, like, because he's the guy that is the, um, the, the, I don't want to use the word God, but the. You know, because he's the driving the head, force behind it, right? Driving force of the vision, you know? And and, and so I, I, ever since I was five, I wanted to be a Spielberg, right? And and so um, and so, obviously I was hugely aware of Peter Jackson because, wow, New Zealand has a Spielberg. Um, and I loved The Frighteners. It's still one of my favorite movies. And it's like, oh my God, a New Zealand Spielberg made a, I mean, that, you know, I mean, that movie was written for Robert Zemeckis um, who was um, basically the apprentice of Spiel Spielberg made Zemeckis and then Zemeckis helped make Peter Jackson, the trickle down effect of Spielberg's genius. And and and, um, and and Poltergeist being the secret, not directed by Steven Spielberg movie, even though it was directed by Steven Spielberg, you know, like um, we suddenly had a New Zealand Poltergeist, which is every bit as good as that movie. It's a fantastic film. Um, and so like I, I was uh, really interested in Peter Jackson at the same time, I was really interested in Lord of the Rings. At the same time, I was absolutely obsessed with creature features and special effects. Uh, the makings of movies were always more interesting than the movies to me. Um, and the, 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 this was just at the dawn of DVDs. So suddenly DVDs were coming out and um, every, every movie that I ever loved suddenly had an hour and a half documentary to them that I could never see before. All of this was happening at the same time and smacking me around the day my dad brought home a newspaper they said, oh, look, they're, they're making uh, Lord of the Rings in New Zealand. Um, and, uh, and in the picture, 
was Ian McKellen. Now, at the same time, I was also, um, this is embarrassing, but I was the country's top student Shakespeare actor um, because basically, because I was obsessed with, with Richard III, right? And I did, I'd just been Richard III in the, the pl school play or something. I'm trying to not muddle up my timelines. But, um, and, and so I was obsessed with, with Ian McKellen who just made this amazing contemporary Richard III movie. And, um, and Ian McKellen was Gandalf. And so all of my passions in my life just kind of went into this newspaper article. And that's the newspaper article I read that wetter effects are doing this. And that's the first time that I learned that um, I knew about New Zealand's Spielberg called Peter Jackson, but I didn't know we had our own Phil Tippett, right? I didn't know New Zealand had its own Rick Baker, um, Stan Winston in the form of Richard Taylor and Where to Workshop. I mean, I, you know, I guess they made some of the ghosts somewhere in The Frighteners, but even though The Frighteners is an amazing, fantastical movie, it's not packed with creature features. Um, it is actually packed with a huge amount of special effects from Weta, but the movie doesn't dwell on them. You know, it, it, it doesn't feel like Jabba's Palace. It's not a creature feature, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, and so I just, I had Weta on my, and so from the age, you know, 14, 15, I just decided, decided I'm going to work at Weta. And, um, and so every... Um, the several schools, the high schools that I went through and got kicked out of and moved on to and, and um, I just turned every single class, every art class, I failed all of them because I tried to turn every single class into how I can build my folio for where to workshop. I took sculpting, um, painting, design, photography, um, everything and I tried to make every single, I tried to change the curriculum in every class and teachers don't like that apparently um, and, and I, but by the end of it I had created um, I had no school qualifications, but I had the folio that I needed to get to Richard Taylor. And um, and then this is where it gets interesting because um, I, I didn't, the internet existed, but I didn't really know what it was or have it, right? I didn't know about emails. I had, And my brain doesn't, still to this day, doesn't really work like how I see regular people's brains work. Like it, like the ways to reach Richard Taylor that I probably could have reached him just weren't on my radar. And I had no idea how to find this man now that I've built this folio. And and um, a lot of that folio, by the way, I threw out and started again once the Fellowship of the Ring special features came out. And you've got Richard Taylor for nine hours talking you through how they made Lord of the Rings and how they designed the fighting Uruk High. And I'm just like absorbing this all in, going like, tell me you know and so like i i so, and so i'm hearing richard talk about we designed the rohirrim 30 different times for peter and all this kind of stuff i'm like multiple designs okay that's amazing and so um i just gave myself a brief and i took the wizard of oz which is a universal language really like everybody knows the wizard of oz even if you hadn't read um the book you know yeah. um frank's book and so i just took like 10 characters from the wizard of oz and i designed each of them three completely different times and between that and like the mordheim city i'm building and um out of like polystyrene in my and mum's garage and um a couple shots of the fantasy um movies that i'd made rubber masks for at high school that was my folio but and then how do i get this to richard and um i'd saved up all of my pizza restaurant pocket money to go see David Bowie when he came to to Wellington and um I was just about to you know buy the tickets because I had to fly to Wellington and get a hotel and and buy the actual concert ticket and then that's when I heard that Vigo Mortensen was having a photography show that you could buy a ticket to in Wellington and it was right at the end of Return of the King wrapping up and I just knew everyone was going to be there for it and I I like Vigo what a great actor and you know from everything I hear, a wonderful man. But I didn't really have a lot of interest in his fantastic photography. I just realized I, I only had, I had this Bowie money saved up. And since five, I needed to see David Bowie. Um, I, I'm actually like my, I'm the result of my teenage birth parents meeting at a David Bowie concert at the 1983 series Moonlight concert. So he, he's been this weird, form in my life guiding my path you know anyway so um and i just made this decision i'm going to spend my bowie money 
to go to this Vigo art show so I can see Richard Taylor. And I go there um, and, and um, everyone but Richard Taylor is, is there. And, you know, and lucky he wasn't there. Like you want to go to your mate's show and some kids going, look at my fat Leo, but I, I don't know how <laughs> asked it to me. But um, it, it was funny, you know, like all my heroes are there and, and you know, having a, a chat to people. And, and um, I go up to Brian Sibley, who's a who's a Tolkien scholar, and he's in some of the DVDs. And I'm like, oh, hi, my, hi, Mr. Sibley. He's like, who are you? I'm like, oh, I'm nobody. I'm just a fan. And he goes, nobody's ever recognized me. And then um, he, he takes me by the arm and, he, and he's like, Alan Lee, have you met my friend Johnny? Elijah, have you met my good friend Johnny? You know, and it was, <laughs> and so like my head was like as a teenager who just absolutely like Fellowship of the Ring for me was like the the same effect as Labyrinth at Five. It was okay. The game's changed again. You know, it took that long for a movie to be as life changing as Labyrinth, but it really was. Well, I mean, Jurassic Park was up there but it really was with, with fellowship of the ring and absolutely obsessed with those movies and now meeting a lot of the people that were in them and, and created them and stuff and i said well richard wasn't there um and i missed bowie but that was a really nice experience and then that went to my hostel and then the next day I, I flew out of wellington and um and then i'm at the airport and um i'm reading the book which was Christopher Tolkien's edited appendices of the Trees and Weisinger. And um, I realized, oh God, I'm going to be late for my plane. And I'm running across the airport and I see Richard Taylor. Um, there used to be an octopus in a tank at the airport in, New Zealand, in Wellington. And he's there with his little son, Sam, um, who's now twice as tall as me and studying engineering. He's a great kid. And anyway, but he's this little toddler and he's talking to this woman who's looking at him like, what is this man talking about? And he's going, this is the same octopus we based Watcher in the Water on from Fellowship of the Ring. And she didn't know what he was talking about. But I'm like, oh, do I miss my flight? Or, or do I talk to Richard? And I'm like, here's the whole reason I'm here. I'll figure out how to fly home, you know. Um, uh, and so I'm like, hi, Richard. Um, look, uh, I all I want to do is work at Weta. I've been working on this folio. Do you have any hints or tips? And and the gracious man that he is, you know, he, he gives he's telling me all these great hands and tips and blah 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 blah, um, and you know I'm standing there in my favourite special feature, listening to um, New Zealand's own Phil Tippett, you know, and to me like, you know, kids grow up idolising Michael Jordan or, or uh, Michael Jackson, but like for me it was it was Phil Tippett, Ralph McQuarrie, Brian Froud. Jim Henson like they were my sport and rock stars you know um and and, and so now I'm talking to the New Zealand Jim Henson and, and and he's he the thing but this is this is Richard Taylor right when he and he says look when you're finished uh, when I impersonate him I can't help but it and it's done out of such love in the same way that I would impersonate like you know Michael Caine or or, or some other huge lovable character you know but it's like it's like here's my card when you've finished your folio don't send it up bring it up right and then um that's a huge story of how i actually even got to sit in front of him because what had happened is return of the king had just finished i'm trying to abbreviate it return of the king had just finished and every single person on planet earth wanted a bit of richard taylor mm. um because he was this huge success that had just taken every oscar out of the oscars and come home with them you know <laughs> and um and so he went from under the radar to being the central point of all radars you know and um, i just couldn't his receptionists were told not to let people through to him especially nobody kids i'm on their side of course you know i don't feel like bad juju over there you know but um Anyway, after months and months of calling, I called back on the last time and I, and then I was going to go, okay, I guess I'm not going to work in film anymore. And on that last time, it just so happens that it was like, okay, can you come up Monday? I'm like, yeah, I'll be there Monday. And um, anyway, so I show up and I show him a folio and he goes through every single page and gives me, um, you know, really realistic feedback on my stuff. And he says like, um, what's amazing about your folio is is that you've designed every, like, all these different characters three different times. Nobody does that which is great because i've learned it from him and um from watching his special features and then he, he also was actually really taken by the mordheim city that i'd built 
but, um, because it's like, well, you know, we've got a miniatures department and it, I love that you're interested in all these disciplines. It's like, we're just starting miniatures on King Kong at the moment. It's like, you, I'll be, I'll level with you. You're not good enough to be in the, the design room at the moment. Um, but if you want to start on King Kong in the miniatures department, I'll, I'll, I'd be happy for you to build up your skills and work your way up to the design room. So I'm, I'm a teenager sitting there asking to be on the most creative, the, the most creative team of people to ever sit in one room on the planet earth since Sid Mead and Ralph Macquarie designed Star Wars, you know what I mean? And, but I always dream big and, and um, I've always said like my one superpower is utter naivety. Um, it, it's It's got me to so many places I never would have got if I was smarter, you know? Um, anyway, so, and, and look, it got me through the doors at Weta. And so for six months, I'm carving life-size dinosaur bones out of polystyrene, mm. um, you know, just bathing in chemicals, thinking I'm the luckiest little boy ever. And then um, and then a year and a half, basically working on every single one of the 65 miniatures of Skull Island. There are more miniatures in King Kong than the three Lord of the Rings movies put together. Wow. And there isn't a single one in The Hobbit because of where digital technology had, had come from, you know, and, um, and that, so, so now I'm a, war, I'm a war gamer going from, I wish I knew, I wish I had more resources to make better terrain to um, having you, to having access to the rock that they made Rivendell and Minas Tirith and Helm's Deep out of, right? <laughs> And, and scraps of it that are going in the dumpster because they're not big enough for like a warehouse-sized bit of Skull Island mm. that Kong's going to run over for three seconds and you're not going to look at because you're obviously going to be looking at the monkey. Anyway, but it was great paid work, you know. So I'm now like in my weekends and after work and in my lunch breaks, I'm making I'm making this terrain um, to supplement my games of Battles in Middle Earth, which I was obs obsessively collecting and, and painted every every miniature of. Um, so now I've got this great, you know, Middle Earth train happening, and um, you know, to be honest, and then so um, every single night and every single weekend for about two years, I'd go home and just c continue to develop my conceptual design skills. And once a week, I'd take them to Richard, and um, um, and so 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 between the fact that I just kept showing that I wanted to be a conceptual designer and the fact that according to Richard, I have the highest accident and emergency rate in the New Zealand film industry. Um, he gave me a job in the design room because one, he, and he liked my persistence and two, he said, it's the only place in the building where I can't cut myself anymore. <laughs> um, and I wasn't doing it for attention. I legitimately was cutting myself open quite a lot, but 50 hours a week for two years, holding a Tajima cutting, stuff you know it's statistically i wasn't cutting myself that often but um yeah I, I i got taken to hospital quite a few times it was it wasn't funny after a while um one of them was nearly fatal but anyway so like it, i end up so my first design gig richard um lets me design on prince caspian you know and um uh, and i I'm a strict Middle Earth man myself, um, but you know, Narnia is Narnia. At least there's monsters in it. Um, I'll, I'll take it, you know. And um, and that's where I kind of broke my teeth in the design room. Um, and and you know, the thing is, it's like the opportunity that someone like Richard gives someone like me who who's hungry for it. Um, I went from doing pretty shoddy work that you won't see anywhere you know, online on purpose for Prince Caspian and, and not getting a single hit on that movie to um, getting hit after hit after hit um, on Steven Spielberg's Tintin on the next one, you know, because I got that opportunity to brush my skills up on the job on Prince Caspian and um, now Spielberg's rubber stamping characters of mine for a Tintin movie, you know? Um, and that comes from... Um, the the mindset of someone like Richard, who is a man that created a company that gives opportunities. Um, to this day, I don't think he knows how many high schools I failed. You know, because the what the academia on paper of no importance to him. But um, 
he said on the day as well, like I'm hiring you based on your enthusiasm and you can build your skills up, but you can't, he, he believes, and I do too, you can't do it the other way around. You, you can't get a really talented person and train them to be passionate and enthusiastic. Um, I've met, I've met people that like um, are more talented than I'll ever be in my life. But, um, and this isn't a judgment. I'm just saying like that they'll, they'll go home after a day's work and just turn on the PlayStation or, or you know, or, or, or the television. And um, it, it always reminds me of that scene in Game of Thrones where they've tied up Hodor outside Craster's keep and, and Rasp, I think he's called, but they're all kicking him. And, and it's like, if I was as big as you, I'd be king of the world. And I always, I, I see that with some people's talent, you know, it's like, man, if I could do what you could do, I'd be king of the world, but like, I won't be as good, I won't be as good as you in 50 years, but, but you gotta, you know, you just, I guess if you're hungry for it, it's, um, yeah, well, I can't stop. I can't stop anyway. Like I feel physically ill when I'm not being creative. So it, it helps that there was for the first 17 years of my career anyway, someone like Richard who provided me a safe, space um that wasn't an asylum you know to to be able to express that level of, of creativity and and grow as an artist and a, and, a, and a person and yeah yeah i mean so what was yeah. the the timeline then so you've come in and you've worked on prince caspian you've moved from kong where you were doing the physical sort of model making to caspian for your design. Caspian and then, Tintin. And then Tintin. Well, the whole time for that? this is this is five years of probably go by five long years and and mm. and um and from day one of getting to weta like the, the first day i was there i was carving polystyrene under the three stone trolls and, and the animatronic tree bed while down the other end they were they were finishing off the miniature that unleashes all of the skulls in dunharrow city of the dead that was going to get plugged into the extended dvd scene of return of the king you know when the stupid amount of skulls kind of fall out you know right. um and so like return of the king was wrapping up but from that day up until all you know tintin years and years later in my mind anyway it was a long time ago i'm trying to remember here but i definitely i was always like like, like it seemed like any day now they're gonna do the hobbit right because everyone was waiting for the hobbit um, and I think Weta itself as a facility that relies on big fantasy projects to um, keep their people employed um, was waiting for The Hobbit. But obviously it was it was tied up in um, legality licensing nightmare with I think it was Sol Zans owned the rights or something. The, the Hobbit was different, obviously, to The Lord of the Rings. And um, it was, I, I can't remember now, but there, there was, it was, it, it, it took so long to get get the right deal to get the rights to make the movie back blah 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 mm. but anyway by by this point obviously i mean you can see in the special features um how exhausted poor old peter is having he's like, you know he's like, no one's filmed uh films three three films back to back and i can see why no one no one has or, or ever will you know he's, he's absolutely bet down and um and so we, obviously you've got to make the hobbit and obviously if someone's going to make The Hobbit, it has to be the people that made The Lord of the Rings and reinvented the way you make fantasy films. And um, but if in the same way that George Lucas felt he needed um, to bring in Irvin Kirshner to direct Empire Strikes Back so he could focus on the bigger picture of what Star Wars was, I guess Peter did the same thing. But it's like, you're not just going to get anyone in, right? But who's who's the next biggest fantasy director after Peter at the time? And it was it was Guillermo del Toro. I think the, the the problem there is you don't become the current biggest fantasy director of all time um, by by not sticking to your own creative vision. Hmm. You, you know what I mean? Um, like Guillermo is an absolute force of nature, um, and they both have very very different directing styles. And the year spent on Guillermo, as a conceptual designer, the year spent on Guillermo's Hobbit versus the year spent on Peter's Hobbit were were completely, they couldn't have been two different experiences. And I, I don't mean positive and negative, mm. either, you know, but it, it, like um, um, Guillermo is just, just very, very hands-on. Um, like, 
it got to the point where we um we had to ask Guillermo to stop coming in so much um because like he wasn't giving us enough time to do more stuff because he loved being in the creative environment that the wetted design room provided mm. and um at one point um i was designing the three trolls uh bert william and tom um and you know i'm loving it you know because i'm drawing these things and um i hadn't finished the design you know and i don't know pride of an artist or whatever um i look forward to fin you want to show the finished design you know um because if someone sees something half done it doesn't resonate or whatever not with gamma so gamma my my cubicle happened to be right next to the the meeting room door and so he's walking past and i'm trying to finish it before the meeting or something and he walks past the door and he's like are those the trolls i'm like uh yeah yeah it's like they're done those are the trolls it's in the movie i'm like what he's like, yeah, those are the trolls. i'm like oh can i can i finish the design like, no i'm like and so I, i'm there like and this is back when this kind of thing was really important to me as a young conceptual designer. And it's like my three favorite characters and my favorite book for, for my favorite directors that just happened. Right. Of course that all got um, binned and shelved and, and lost when it started again on, on Peter's thing. And of course you've got to wipe this like clean and, and move on. But um, yeah, so I ended up sculpting the markets for these trolls. And, and um, I guess I can talk about this because somehow they did end up in, and the art of the hobbit book but um guillermo's trolls were gonna have um he had me des design them with he wanted them to have three huge backpacks that they did their looting with and then i went down this mad design tangent that guillermo just let me do um the whole time i was designing this i was so excited it's like oh my god because i was so obsessed with battles for middle earth it's like games workshop are going to be making my trolls and like anything I design is going to be made in plastic by Games Workshop, and like, look, I, I don't, I don't know if there's ever been a situation, ever, where someone who is as much of a fan as like as something as Games Workshop is as much of a fan as The Hobbit and is designing on it. You know what I mean? It's like, mm. I was, and in, in some ways, I was getting to design my dream Games Workshop miniature at the highest level, <laughs> which is not why I was there. And was not why I was getting paid, but no one else knew that. I knew that, right? So I'm there designing what is going to be the best Games Workshop miniature ever. That was now my brief, not what was going to make Guillermo so better, not what was going to be. I mean, and then what I created, I'll never forget like Dan Henner, who was the production designer that had to physically make what I designed. One time he saw me, like, You designed the backpacks, did you? Great. Yep. Anyway, but so the backpacks, because like, what? How does a troll make a backpack? He doesn't go down to Kathmandu and get a hiking pack, right? And so I figured they'd cram them together out of um, out of their raids on settlements, right? But then I thought, I want every, I want all three backpacks to be completely original and never use reuse the same element. But they also um, had to explain a character. So and then, but um, by this stage, I was. Guillermo had asked me to give art lessons to his family once a week. So I was at Guillermo's house once a week and we would keep talking about it. And then um, we we kind of discussed how Guillermo thought it would be hilarious if, if one of the trolls, um, I don't know if I can swear on your channel, but he just always called them the bitch. And like, so they had this cooking bitch and, and like there were two kind of tough, you bloody, you know, masculine, you know trolls but then there was one that was like their bitch who was doing all the cooking and and so for for that backpack i i, I crammed like um a chicken coop in with a, a smoking rack and i you know um and and i made like um a frying pan out of a bronze statue of like from a graveyard of someone holding a book and all the cooking utensils were like um farming implements and they had a spice rack and, and everything. And then one who I thought would be the most militant, boisterous one, his was kind of crammed together out of more siege warfare, like a catapult and a and and um I, I forget now. And then one I thought was more of a hunter-gatherer. So they had like a wagon with full of goats and all this stuff. And there's about a hundred elements in every backpack. And you know, and I'm scraping Google you know, Google images together and painting this up. And then um 
And then all of a sudden there was this huge fluster around the workshop and it's like Warner Brothers are coming in three weeks and um, they want to see what's happening with Guillermo's thing and we want to put our best foot forwards. And I was like, oh, I'll sculpt the trolls for you. And he's like, really? You can do all three of those? I'm like, yep. And then um, he went away and Richard's like, Johnny, do you know what you've just said? I'm like, yep. <laughs> and then so, um, I got, there was this amazing model maker called Shari who went on to be a model maker for Leica that, you know, she's that good. And so I was art directing her to model make these three. So she did about, I would call it like seven months work in three weeks, making these three backpacks, every element, all those elements I've named 10 and there's a hundred elements that made these backpacks and she's model making and putting together while I'm sculpting trolls and different backpack positions that will hope. And then that goes to molding and casting and painting and everything coming together. And I'm obviously one cog in this huge machine. Everyone's getting their thing ready for this big presentation, but um, yeah, these beautiful markets came together um, of, of, of these, these trolls and you, you get to see a hint of them in, in, in the book, but um. There was a, there was when I that was probably the thing I was most proud of in the film industry because um then because I'd made a a friendship with the Perry twins um I went over to um England and um uh, to 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 see a friend during the project of The Hobbit and um just to give you an idea of what it's like to work with some of these like, these people like at a lunch. I told Guillermo del Toro, I was like, look, I'm going to be away for the next month to go to England. And Alan Lee is sitting next to him. Who, you know, so I, I, I'm a teenager working with Alan Lee and John Howe um, and even Mike McNola from the Hellboy comics. I got it, like, I had his art tattooed to my arm and now we're, we're in the same design meetings, you know? Um, and I, I, I call the person in my time of life at my age with this being in the past, probably shouldn't be getting as excited about these memories or trying to play it cool but it was cool man it was it's so i mean it's a it's a happy time in my life you know and anyway so like i tell gamma i'm going over to england um and alan lee um just this god of a man and and i worshipped his work before i got there and now we're sitting in meetings cordially talking about our art and like walking i walked out of a meeting once and and John Howe said to me once, he's like, um, he's like, uh, I don't want to do his voice, but you know, he, he said like, I'm, he wasn't on board with all of how fantastical Guillermo was going with the movie, but he said, your, your trolls are, 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 are really hit my vision of Tolkien or something like that. And um, I said, oh, thanks, John. And it's like, <laughs> you know, to hear that, do you know what I mean? That's like Jim Henson telling you you're a fantastic puppeteer or something. It was, it was just, <laughs> but, but so yeah. And in, in this in this lunch, um, Alan Lee's like, "Oh, you're going to England. Uh, would you like to borrow my house?" I'm like, "What?" You know. And so like Alan Lee lends me his house in Chadford, Devon, um, which is this beautiful like little Warhammer village, right? And then while I'm there, I wandered down the road and got to have lunch with Brian and Randy Froud at their house. And so like all of my life goals are getting complete. And then I go and stay with the Perry twins um, who have separate houses, but in the same kind of block. Um, I don't know what you call them. The, you got the key codes and gates and stuff. And sure. it's a beautiful little block in Nottingham. Um, you know, and each house has the big, lovely Napoleonic painting of them as generals that their friend from games workshop did and um and, and the, just these lovely guys who barely knew me but just like alan lee like the perry twins so like oh our house is your house and and then they got to take me around games workshop and so i, I had a meeting with the top brasses of games workshop all of which you've now interviewed and i'm like oh, i recognize that guy you know <laughs> and and um and so i'm just freaking out talking about them like oh get excited you're gonna like and i was telling them all the stuff that's gonna um be coming from Guillermo's movie into the game um like I had no idea um some of the stuff I've learned previously and then some extra on top of that just from your interviews of um how potentially you know the battles for middle earth game had begun to not be um as popular in the the that you know I was just saying before that gap we're all waiting for the next Hobbit movie to come out everyone thought it would be hmm. you know 
but they didn't know that it was going to be like Star Wars staggered between like the next trilogy, you know, and 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 and, and so I was probably all of my excitement may have been falling on deaf ears of them going, uh huh, uh huh, we're never going to afford that. <laughs> I'm not sure, but I just I, I just got really excited about potentially being the la- the liaison between uh, where to workshop and and games workshop because they were my two uh favorite things on planet earth you know for me uh, t- to this day I, honestly i i um outside of the work ralph macquarie and sid mead did on the original star wars trilogy um where to workshop and games workshop they are the two like most prolific original consistently brilliant facilities of inspired imaginative flawless conceptual design and i i don't put my i don't even put myself in that camp the 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 couple of trolls and dwarves and flippant little things i did my little footnote in the history of weta whatever i'm talking about jamie biswarik and ben Wooten and daniel falconer and and richard taylor and the real geniuses there like the, the you know i still look back and just i'm blown away by what I saw on a daily basis on their desks, but I'm talking their stuff like, like and what Games Workshop do um, to the amount that they do. It's just um, for someone like me who's an obsessed with world building and is a passionate world builder, there are no two greater places. There's there's companies, you know, that, like Stan Winston did some amazing stuff, like a little bit on this film, a little bit on that film, some great dinosaurs here and there, but uh, um. I can name so many companies that have done mind-bogglingly outstanding creative effects and designs. Um, well, really, let's just talk about designs because Games Workshop don't do effects. But um, just from a conceptual design point of view, there are no uh, two other companies that have that could equal the body of work um, mm-hmm. and, and and the the caliber and and the quality. And I don't just mean like um, oh they got some good designers painting some good things. I'm I'm, I'm really really talking about um the actual the quality of the thought behind the conceptual designs itself something in one of your previous interviews i can't remember who it is now because i I watched them all in succession (laughs) in the same way that i i probably i know every tom Waits song by heart but i probably couldn't tell you which album it's from because i'm just always listening to it you know what i mean (laughs) but anyway but somebody mentioned um you know and and the, in the aftermath of of killing the old world for Age of Sigma, it did lead to the freeing and opening of conceptual designs. And I I don't know if it was in my head or they may have mentioned it, but definitely a, a I, I could personally take or leave Stormcast myself, but um, that's nobody's problem. But the 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 the, the I'm going to say it wrong because I always second guess myself. But the, is it Caradon Overlords? The I think it's Caradron. Over- Caradron Overlords, yeah. right? Yeah, I think. Um, I've spent thousands of dollars on them. Can't say their name. <laughs> um, yeah, um, just the, just mm. some of the like they wouldn't really fit in the old world, but the 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 clean slate, um, outside of any like "ow, my heart's broken" or politics aside from that, or like how could you make that decision and think it was good? Whatever politics you have around that, you know what I mean? Um, it's like some of the designs around that stuff are so original. Like mm. there's nothing like, yes, there's obviously inspirations there. Like they didn't invent uh, steampunk, but it's not steampunk. There's an influence there. They didn't invent flying ship. They didn't even invent the way dwarves look. You, you know what I mean? Mm. Um, Games Workshop certainly have helped define and, and flavor how dwarves look um, nearly more than anyone though. But still like just the, the level of design of what Games Workshop have been doing in recent years. I mean, I mean, because let's face it, for so many years, it, um, it was derivative of seventies depictions of Lord of the Rings. You know, like they didn't invent that look of orc, but they mastered it. You know, and then World of Warcraft completely ripped it off. But like, I still think of it as the Games Workshop orc or whatever. But like. Dwarves sort of look like dwarves and elves sort of look like elves when Games Workshop began developing them. But you you see stuff in the wake of Age of Sigma that is that is, is such sure 
candid conceptual original genius um I, I buy heaps of it without ever playing a game like a lot of people but i just like I, just holding it and painting it and getting to put my flavor over it it's um it's such an inspiring time uh to to, to be a gamer and a, and a conceptual artist and that's that's what actually pulled me into the world of of of, of gaming really it just felt like the well, this, is, this, is, this is another story. I feel I feel like I'm still not answering even what your last question is. Ah, you absolutely sure. are. No, but I think that that is an interesting sort of transition, though, that you've made. So you talked about how Weta, whilst you were there, you were increasingly spending that extra time on the gloaming and doing your own world building and getting more into that and that sort of passion. So how, how did that transition actually take effect? How did you move from working in the film industry to working in, in a sort of gaming and a, a modeling space? Well, so after two years of being in miniatures when I got the and doing the two years I spent in miniatures I spent all my spare time trying to become a better concept artist and then after two years I got the role in the concept design department and um so I figured well I'm getting I'm now getting paid 50 hours a week to do to become the better conceptual designer so I'm going to spend all of that time I was trying to be a better conceptual designer to be a better sculptor because I was spending all of my lunch breaks in the sculpting room anyway like you, like I, I'm not articulate enough to put into words what the labyrinth and Jabba's palace did for me. Um, like the what Phil Tippett produced for Jabba's palace, and and what the team of people produced for Labyrinth, like that physical, like even today with today's special effects, CG does nothing for me. You know what I mean? Mm. Even the best CG, I just don't care. Give me a, a give me a rubber costume dimly lit behind Jabba and like I'm still pausing it to see you know like that the internet's almost kind of in action figures have kind of spoiled the magic of some of those dimly lit figures in a way but but the, the majesty of of creature effects and stuff like that so um getting to sculpt my own after growing up holding them my whole life you know with like I said with He-Man and Thundercats and all that stuff I just wanted to sculpt and um there was this period of time I, I think it was actually between king kong and, and tintin where there was four or five months where there wasn't any work for me and um and that happens a lot in the film industry you know and i just i go that's fine richard would you mind if i just use that spare desk in the sculpting room and taught myself to sculpt it's like oh that's a great idea and then i and so i started kind of sculpting a goblin right well actually i started sculpting john hurt as the storyteller but i wasn't a good enough sculptor it didn't look like john hurt there are all these great forms there and it wasn't a bad sculpt but it was a bad sculpt if you looked at it as john hurt as the storyteller and so i started turning into a goblin so i started making a pretty good goblin and then um i showed richard and and we're in the kitchen and he just took out a teaspoon and starts carving into it and um in this in this terrifying kind of three minutes of sculpting with richard i learned more than i had in um three years anywhere else do you know what i mean um but it kind of occurred to me that it's like I could like Johnny sculpts a goblin and like yep okay that's that's Johnny's goblin like what have I learned from that because you can't say that's not Johnny's goblin there's nothing to reference it to and so I thought my favorite creature feature in the history of film is Hoggle so I started I just decided I'm going to sculpt Hoggle until I get him right and I spent months and thousands of dollars creating a life-size Hoggle and then I also did Alf and Ralph who are the two riddle shield guys <laughs> based on the suit based on the, the naive thought, it's like, oh, they've got four heads, but it's the same sculpt. So I'd only need to do one sculpt on one hand and I'll be able to make them, not thinking about the months it took to make the rest of their body and the costume and the eyebrows. Anyway, so I had three life-size, after about six months and as many grand, I ended up with three life-size replicas from the labyrinth, which were pretty bloody good for someone teaching himself how to sculpt. And so I had, I had achieved my mandate and how I learned to sculpt. But then I looked at them and I thought, Man, if I'd been making my own thing, I'd, I'd be halfway towards quite an exciting IP. And um, that happened around the same time as I picked up Tony Disability's Spiderwick Field Guide with all these watercolor, beautiful pictures in it. And and um, absolutely, um, I'm probably saying his name wrong too. And Alessio Calvatore's name. I, I second guess every word that comes out of my mouth because I always get people's names wrong. Anyway, but I'm, I'm looking at the Spiderwick and I'm thinking, you know, I'm 20 years old my mind is just warping at how awesome it is. And I, and I thought, I want to, I need, 
I don't want to just sculpt a goblin and go, there's a goblin again, right? I wanted to give myself a project that anything I sculpted went into that project. So the project grew stronger as I grew stronger as an artist. Um, all of my friends had like 30, 40, $60,000 loans from university to get the job they wanted. And I already had the job I wanted without having to go to university. I went straight from high school to my dream job. And so I thought, I'm just going to give myself one of those like 60 grand loans everybody has, but I'm going to put it towards my own thesis, right? Um, and instead of instead of ending up 60 grand in debt with a certificate that says I can't be employed somewhere because I didn't think this through, <laughs> I'm, I, I'll, 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 I would have spent that 60 grand on um, my thesis, which will be um, all, all of the, basically Jabba's Palace, but for the fairy world like oh you, you know like can you imagine just walking around Jabba's palace and being in the presence of those aliens I wanted to do that but for medieval folklore right and so I thought that like I'm not an amazing watercolor painter like um like Tony from Spiderwork but um I'm I'm really passionate about sculpting I can't stop myself I may as well turn it into a project so something might come out of it um but the, the project defined what I sculpted and, and it fed into itself in a beautiful structured way for someone as me that, you know, I can't even complete a sentence. How am I going to complete a project, you know? And and, um, and the more I sculpted, the more I needed to sculpt and the more I needed, to, yeah, it just kept, it was the snake eating its own tail. And um, I just kept building and building this world. And, um, and, and you know, I'd, anytime there was work at Weta, I'd take it. But between the projects and then at lunch times, after work, and every single weekend, um, I had this. Richard let me have this multi-million dollar facility. And the thing is, the, the more, the better Weta did, the more Oscars they got, the more Lord of the Rings and and Avatars and what's that one? The um, District Nines, you know, the the more accolades they got, the bigger the company grew, as it should. And the bigger the company grew, the more people. Um, it had to hire to run the company facility because they're, they're dealing with millions and millions and millions of dollars from Warner Brothers and, and you know, New Line Cinema, whoever. And um, and obviously, like you, if you've, it's been interesting hearing how much Games Workshop have talked about, um, like, you know, you've, you've got people in creative roles for years. Um, it's actually not in the company or that person's interest to bump them up to a managerial role mm. that's not that's not a gift it's actually a punishment um and and um yeah that like, weather is 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 like that um you huge projects need managers um and and so you've got to kind of bring people in that may have worked for pepsi or non you know, not very few jobs are goblin and troll related you know but these jobs <laughs> They need, they need management managing anyway right so you know the, the bigger way to grow the more management teams are, are managing these creatives who who um feel that they know better in some cases we probably do but in a lot of cases we absolutely need management you know someone like me who can't deal with authority um and gets kicked out of high school because of that kind of thing like it you know um, it's not like I'm not a team player. Um, I don't know what I am or was anyway, but it is what it is. But um, there were the, the there were people whose job it was to make the company run efficiently, right? And so, what do you do with a Johnny Fraser Allen? Um, and like so, and and, the, and from what Richard tells me, there were people who would be like, "Why is Johnny still here doing his own goblins? Like that's a desk we could be using for sculpting." I'm on those people's side. Like, I don't feel victimized um, or disliked in that situation. Their job is to cut the fat off the bacon and I'm the streakiest part, you know. And, um, but Richard, and again, this is like, I'm just being self-aware of that situation I'm in. And I'm not like, again, I don't, I don't have negative feelings towards it. Like I, those people were doing their, their job. Hmm. They should, you know, but it's just amazing that in all those situations, Richard would be like, no, leave Johnny. He's doing his thing. Um, you know, and now the gloaming is a huge exhibition that he's taken around the world and has permanently displayed in his permanent exhibition in Auckland. Um, but also, what I learned from the gloaming, what how build, I built up skills on the gloaming that I didn't get a chance to do on um, some of the paid jobs. 
Um, and I got to develop my my world building to a point that, I mean, Adam Savage on Tested has done a, a feature on it, but Richard had me art direct the entire fantasy section of this huge multi-million dollar exhibition that they created in Auckland, which I did this kind of like fantasy was I, I put Dungeons and Dragons together with my fascination of dinosaurs and kind of created a D&D dinosaur world. But anyway, I was only in a position where Richard could go, Johnny can art direct this project, not because of having worked on the BFG or the Hobbit or anything like that, but because of what I'd created in the gloaming. Hmm. So the, Richard's investment of saying, Johnny's doing his thing, paid, like, all he needed to really do is, um, you know, the company lost some overheads on me using the, the coffee machine and, 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 and some electricity on Saturdays when I was um, sneaking in to work at, at my desk sort of thing. Um, and Richard in his head accepted that as a, as being able to write that off. Hmm. Um, and for me, it meant the world. Um, but because of that, I, I developed the system, well, I don't know, system, but I just, I, I, I would and could never say no to Richard um, because I owed him so much. And it would get me in these situations like, um, two years in a row he had me host this charity event which was just um kind of um body painted models and lingerie models um and i had to come out and host it um which i know it seems like oh tough gig <laughs> but it really was because like richard who i'd known for years he could he saw he saw me as like a little animatic gobshite that could just blah 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 you know and like that'd be great put that on stage and i'm like no, there's having a laugh with you and then there's having a laugh with like 300 paying high society charity people um that are that are getting drunk watching lingerie models and you know and, but but I, but I said yes to it and I did it I did it for two years in a row we, we raised heaps of money for the neonatal ward at the hospital and, and it was worth doing but I just mean like I'd find myself in all these situations that I wouldn't have volunteered for but, and because Richard knew I'd, I'd say yes to them one of them was um he had me set the entire gloaming up to show Prince Charles and um and we had to get this these the people came in and they're like um you can't touch him you can't shake his hand you can only call him your majesty and and, and fair enough that's the, the way the gig is you know and um and then so he he shows up and he's surrounded by you know men in black sunglass people and um I've never been a particularly fast learner and um I said oh get out mate um <laughs> And I called him mate instead of your majesty and went to shake his hand. And um, and the men in black guys kind of step forwards like that. But then Prince Charles just goes, hello, shakes my hand. And um, and then I spend 30 minutes walking him around all these little monsters that I've made, right? And he's he's all engaged and he's fascinating. Like, like I'm, I'm not that fussed about the royal family, but my dad's British and I knew he'd get a kick out of knowing his son. So, you know, and, and, and this, you know, really nice guy is once I started explaining that the gloaming is primarily based on Eurocentric medieval folklore. Um, and I'm only telling the story because this is poss out of all the weird thing, weird and wonderful things that happened to me in the film industry. I think the weirdest one is the now that the now King of England, right. Which again, doesn't mean a lot to me outside of the fact that like, I'm a medieval fantasy nut, you know? So like, <laughs> you know this is like for me it's like it's my world equivalent of Theoden or Denethor or, you know so the future king of England this is a fact in my lifetime has turned around to me looked me in the eye and said tell me Johnny does the gloaming have a burglenoz and I'm like you have to know your deep-seated countryside medieval folklore to know what a burglenoz is I'm like oh yeah Charles it's um it's the one riding the hedgehog he's like wonderful <laughs> <laughs> and then and the funniest thing he says and, and again I'm, I'm saying this story lovingly he was so kind and so engaging and genuinely interested interested in these goblins and trolls and then he says well i just found it so funny he goes now you you must tell me when the gloaming comes out i'm like and I, i'll give you a text <laughs> what am i supposed to, <laughs> am I supposed to tell? and and it's a it's gonna be coming out next year finally but i'm not sure how i'm gonna let the king of england know that but um, <laughs> it was a really pleasant experience with a really pleasant man for what it was worth but i just thought it was it was it was such a bizarre situation i'd never be in outside of um 
but again like so that stuff happened all the time and yeah. i was like that was a day but then when the perry twins come around because i'm such a you know a collecting white dwarf and so obsessed and um anyway so the, the i had this huge body of work that became the gloaming which became an exhibition and it was you know i was figuring out um i really wanted to tell a story with it right and um it's become an amazing game thing that I'm developing that I'll talk about in a minute for a, for a reason. But um, ultimately what I want to do is be a, a world builder. And um, I realized I, I, I was never going to be a Peter Jackson. Um, the, the, not because I, I, I'm lazy or don't have the passion for that, but like the, the world of Hollywood that you've got to fight through, like um, you've got to be absolutely superhuman you know, and I'm driven and creative and excited and stuff, but um, it's a different caliber of man to do that level of creativity, but also go out and do the junkets and work with the actors and and, and have all those disappointments and fund it. And um, like, I just, I just had to be realistic about like, I'm not a Peter Jackson superhuman. And as much as I'd like to direct my vision onto the cinema, um, that you know like that is just too pie in the sky for me but, but also like I, i'd come to realize through um b because i thought i was a direct i wanted to be a director up until about 25 i was still spending a lot of my money i earned at weta making like little fantasy short films with like my, my friends and um you know putting a lot of time and money into all the building the world when i got time to shooting it i tried to kind of rush through it or get other people to do this and that and and i kind of realized it's like oh i'm really just interested in the world building part i don't i'm not actually a great director of of actors or like I can't just assume that I'm I'm going to edit a good movie because editing is a complete art. Um, you know what I mean? And, and so I, uh, that's why there is an ed editor and a sound editor and a casting director, all that kind of stuff. It's like films take that much because it takes that many experts in this many fields. It's like, well, I just thought I could do all of that. And of course I did because I was a naive idiot and naivety is my power. But anyway, so, but it was a really great learning experience to realize that, no, I am in the right place. I really just want to be a, a world builder, but I still want to do it. It's amazing world building for Guillermo or Peter Jackson or Steven Spielberg. Like, it's nothing to turn your nose at, up at, but I still found myself wanting more, which is what the gloaming became. I still wanted to kind of be the, the head architect of, of a vision. Um, because it's just that's what I enjoy the most you know and that's what I just found myself leaning towards and um and and so I go well how do I get this vision out there if it's not going to be a film and so I started thinking it's going to be um Ill illustrating and so I start making this uh, and because I don't do like I decided to illustrate a book by photographing life-size sculptures before I even knew how to sculpt. I mean, that's how my brain works, right? And so that same brain is, that, that's from the same guy that's like, I'm gonna make this book that's gonna be like Alan Lee's illustrated Lord of the Rings. You know, like it's this big, it's massive. Every kind of 50 pages or whatever is gonna be my insert of the photograph I've made. And I've made like 50 um, these photograph creatures. And, and so the book's gonna be this big. And um, so at the time I was, I was still with, uh, a high school sweetheart who, who, who you know we're broken up now but at the time she she went on to win the man booker prize for her, her book the the luminaries you know like she's a the, this one wonderful amazing author and so um around the time we were kind of splitting up she still wanted she, she graciously tried to help me get in touch with these publishers so i had these meetings with like three or four very big publishers that met me because she made the meeting they had no idea and cared not to know who i am and I, again i'm on the side right but you know they've got this like money making asset girl saying can you you know this my friend's got this book probably and um in all of the meetings none of them would even make eye contact with me and um none of them wanted me to illustrate the book because this was still at a time when she there was this very small time in the gloaming's lifespan where she was going to help write it um which didn't work out and that, that's completely awesome and, and fine um but they would just keep talking to her saying you can write it but 
we don't want Johnny to illustrate it. And I'm kind of like in the room. And then one, one, one meeting, the guy was like, oh, you can illustrate it, but you can, only if you do just do little black and white headings at the each at the start of each chapter. And I was like, the whole, it's an illustrated book. But what they said to me, the thing that really stuck out, and I, I totally agree with them. Again, I'm, talk, I'm talking about this past Johnny as a naive idiot, right? Like, bless his little heart. But, you know, sitting there that I could just assume I'd do these things. And rather than think ahead, I just went and did them. But what someone said to me, it's like, yeah, but you're making, you're, you're trying to make Alan Lee's, like, uh, Lord of the Rings book, right? Um, but you, you don't have Lord of the Rings and you're not Alan Lee. And also we could sell 50,000 copies of her novel or we could sell a few thousand copies of your illustrated book. And everything they were saying was completely right. And their, their complete disdain for me was totally founded, right? Um, but, and I, but I'm sitting there and I went away from those, those meetings and, and me and, you know, the, my girlfriend at the time, you know, we parted our ways in life and stuff, but I, I was still, I'd worked on the gloaming for so many years by that stage anyway. And, and I realized it's like, well, I, I, I felt, I'm not often pleased or impressed with myself, but I, I did feel like, you know, I'm, I was happy that I didn't feel particularly um, destroyed by that. Mm. And all I did, all I did after that was go feel like I'd kind of dodged a bullet because even if it only ever sat on my own shelf, I decided I still want to make that gloaming book. I still want to make my dream book because mm. it was always about making my dream book and not other people's opinions. Um, and that's because I spent 50 hours a week working on other people's creative projects, you know, like designing Spielberg's BFG, designing Peter Jackson's Dwarves, you know, on on Guillermo's Hobbit, at least, um, I got to design whatever the hell I thought would look cool, and Guillermo would be like, hey, man, it's in the movie, that's great, you know, um, and, and so I never felt like, even though I was working on Guillermo's Hobbit, and I think I speak for a lot of the people in it, it was kind of like we weren't working on Guillermo's Hobbit, we were all working on our Hobbit, you know, you know what I mean? because it's like he, he wasn't gatekeeping anything or shutting down any ideas anyway and so I think once that ended there was this massive I'd got a taste for it and there's this massive cavity in my life where I still wanted to have that passion for creativity and that's when when Guillermo left the Hobbit I'd, I'd been working a couple years on on the gloaming but after what I learned from him and some of the conversations we had about how you design fantasy, um, it just changed a lot of me as a designer. And so when he left, I decided to completely devote myself a lot more to the gloaming. Um, we had to dive in head first to redesigning Peter's version of The Hobbit, um, which occupied a lot of my time. But once that started winding down, um, I definitely started becoming more of a gloaming designer than a film designer, but I took the jobs where I could, but that was only really to pay for the gloaming and also to be able to have a foot remaining in Weta because I love being there and I love the people and I love Richard. Um, but I also couldn't, I was halfway through this vision that I couldn't complete if I wasn't able to use Weta anymore. Hmm. And so there was, that was always quite a, a, a pressure for me and always kept me going back and designing on films when I got an opportunity to say, oh yeah, I still work here. You know, my fob still works. <laughs> I'm still, you know, um, but yeah. I was, I was spinning spinning a lot of plates but and, and anyway so like so but then again i've got so many disparate little stories but i ended up illustrating a, a book for evangeline lily um she she plays philippa boyne's avatar in the hobbit movies and and she's uh and, and lost and stuff like that and and she had a kid's book and she was looking for an illustrator and i thought well you know a, a job's a job and um I haven't illustrated a book that's on a shelf yet. This could be a good start, you know, and learn the ropes. And I, I did do the first book, which was ended up, she wanted 17 and I, I didn't have 16 more in me. And so kind of got out of that situation, but it, um, I kind of felt after that, it's like, I'm not, you know, but between that situation and, the the meeting the London publishers situation. I was like, I'm not, you know, I don't know if the if the gloaming how I see it is publishable, 
Hmm. And I don't really have a lot of interest in reshaping the gloaming to be something publishable because it's it's always been a world building vision, you know. And to, let, let's face it, um, the Dark Crystal uh, is the highest creative expression of world building that's ever been, you know, cohesively achieved and put out into the world. Hmm. There is no other better example, and, and 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 done in a time when no one else had done anything like it. I mean, there's not a human in that movie. For, Every reason why that movie is the greatest creative feat of human imagination is also all of the same reasons why it bombed at the box office and no one was ready for it. You know what I mean? And and um, but for me, like that that movie is a work of genius, and um, and I was I wasn't trying to replicate or emulate um, the Dark Crystal, but it, that was um, that was the impossible benchmark I'd set for myself. I hadn't. At nowhere at any time, I was like, I want to be a renowned um, New York Times bestseller or something like that. I just wanted, I was always, I just wanted to be, a, a, I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be the best at anything. And I, I certainly don't consider myself the best at anything, but I, I just wanted to be, I just wanted to reach my personal peak as a world builder. Yeah. And so at one point I thought I was going to be a film, a filmmaker. Then I said, like, I'll, I'll get my vision through illustrating. But then for a long time, I sat in this limbo of like, I've done so much with the gloaming. Uh, yeah. It's a traveling exhibition. I mean, when Stephen Fry saw the gloaming, not only did he offer to narrate it, but he paid for his own studio recording costs in London to do it. And I think that's more of a, a reflection on what a wonderful man Stephen Fry is than how wonderful <laughs> the gloaming is. To be fair. But I mean, like it was reaching people. I, I had created this fantastic body of work that I was proud of. Hmm. Um, and part of me was like, I guess it's, I guess it's just an, it, it, it opened doors for me to work for the Jim Henson company. It opened doors for me to be, to, to art direct a team of the people that I grew up idolizing at Weta on a fantastical project. Hmm. It made me a better artist. Um, you know, so I felt like, it had not been a waste of time or money. Um, and in some ways for there was, there, there was four or five years where I felt like the gloaming has been the gloaming and did what it did. And then the, the quantum shift in me happened, which was, Oh, it turns out being like a lead conceptual designer on Hollywood blockbusters, the dream I envisaged for myself at five years old, wasn't the top of the pyramid of, conceptual world building the um it, it took 17 years of going home every night and making gaming terrain for my, my games workshop games um to um and then getting into dungeons and dragons and and elaborate uh hero quest and mordheim self-made expansions and and then it took all of those years to to real to realize it's like oh man like I'm a gamer. My my I I have so much more fun building worlds for my tabletop than I do for movies. And I'm not saying I didn't have fun. I loved every minute. Well, like any job, there were some really hard times. Um, but that's on the human condition, not on where to workshop. Where to workshop is a fantastic, wonderful place to work with wonderful people. You're gonna have hard times. You're gonna butt heads with some people. You know, um, I think there must have been. 3,000 people come through that place in the 17 years I was there. I didn't get on with three of them. You know, like that's an amazing statistic for any company, you know what I mean? Mm. But um, anyway, but I just realized, man, I, um, I'm i having so much fun being my own Spielberg, being my own Del Toro, setting my own briefs and living up to those expectations. Um, and, and, um, and then that's when this opportunity happened where it's just again the little bowie angel oh he, he hadn't passed on by then but like the the the, the bowie kind of barometer the bowieometer <laughs> that that was guiding me through my whole life i remember just driving home from work one day um i, I just got into hero quest again um i was playing it heaps and heaps and and i was thinking you know what do you know what would make the single greatest board gaming experience of all time? It's the Labyrinth. It, it is a board game. A character gets a party of 
four with and it's basically hero quest you've got um the hoggle's the dwarf ludo is the barbarian right um sarah's the sarah's um the elf and then sididimus is kind of like a, a, a wizard i mean some of those roles might function differently but like they it is here and then they keep opening doors they don't know what's on the other side of them they go through this like masonry maze and and they fight minions getting up to the big boss um it's it's kind of hero quest the movie you know and it's like they would make the single greatest board game it would, it would be even better than hero quest because um you can completely flip dungeon tiles and end up in different parts of the board you've got a 13 round ticking clock and i i started almost panicking i almost had to pull the car over because i thought why has no one made the labyrinth board game i get home and i google labyrinth board game and it just so happened to be in the same week that there was this article it's like river horse get the rights to do labyrinth board game i'm like who the hell are river horse and i google river horse and i'm like alessio Cavatore. so sorry the, my two favorite games were mordheim and battles for middle earth right and i and, and i'd read his battle reports i mean you know what i mean like I, I knew the people in, in White Dwarf magazine in the same way that I can name the members of Led Zeppelin. You know what I mean? Like it's it's the the same situation for me. You know, same in the same way that I can like um, name the, the the Muppet performers and who does Piggy and, and who does Gonzo, or whatever. You know, mm. like, that's the level of fame they occupied for me. And 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 um and because I knew the Perry twins, I just I met. I, emailed them i was like can i um i don't sorry if this is a bit cheeky but can i please have alessio's um email and I'm like yeah okay well, no harm in that I, I wasn't a nutcase off the streets they knew me and, and then i just i emailed alessio my folio um and told him what labyrinth meant to me and and um you know i <sighs> new zealanders are absolutely programmed to not talk themselves up we feel quite ill about it um but if i just write what i've done on paper at Weta, it looks quite good so i just did that i, I worked on this movie blah, 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 blah. and i just said hi you know i'm jennifer israel big fan of yours um i'm the new designer for your labyrinth game um it's not it's gonna be nice working for you so um <laughs> and, and, and Lucio got back to me and, and it was very exciting we had you know some wonderful calls and then we went on to the game i worked on the game and then um and yeah and and that, that was and the, the, so the game didn't turn out to be what i had in, in my head um because um uh alicia i can completely i'm about to we're about to have our first daughter you know and as alicia had a five-year-old daughter and what i just i can't wait for five years from now to watch labyrinth with, with my daughter it's 80 percent of the reason i'm having a kid you know what i mean and, and, and so like alicia's alicia is having this great experience with labyrinth with his daughter and he wanted and you know um you know that his probably two loves in his life are labyrinth and his kid right and so he wanted to double whammy that experience and create a labyrinth board game that dads can play with their kids and he completely nailed that brief he made you know an accessible family board game mm -hmm. um but and 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 and, it, and that gave me the opportunity to um sculpt these labyrinth characters um and illustrate for it but because i it's like the gloaming the gloaming was the biggest project if you'd ever told me if you'd ever told me how much it was going to take and cost me to sculpt lab, like hoggle and alf and ralph i wouldn't have started i don't ever regret having started it if you'd ever told me how much work was going to go into the gloaming how much money and sacrifice and probably relationships right i never would have started it i'm so happy i started it you know what i mean and so the same thing was like like i'd st imagined this labyrinth game and so for, still to this day, for the last five years, I've been making a life, a, 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 a Warhammer scale Jim Henson's Labyrinth um, that I can play, design a 13 hour game around to to play. Right. Um, anyways, and, and so um, and, and so I'm sculpting the miniatures of Labyrinth as three ups, because that's the only way I knew how to do it, because I don't digital model, because I... I respect digital modeling and I now art direct digital modelers for my business. Um, but I don't get joy out of doing it personally. Um, but I, it's an absolutely amazing tool and, and um, we're doing wonderful things with it. But um, I mean, if I'm going to be spending 10 hours a day at work, I got to really love it. And I just love pushing the clay and stuff like that. And 
digital model, like the labyrinth models I art directed Mikey Gilbert to create for say the labyrinth pinball machine I've just art directed for the Jim Henson company and 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 barrels of fun pinball they're actually better sculpts of the wise man and ludo and the doors than i did than i hand sculpted personally right. because of what you can do digitally but um, i mean again my three ups miniaturized and um, into um miniatures that i'm really proud of but it really just woke me up to like I, all of those years i was spent making gaming terrain for myself i never once crossed my mind that there was a career in it Hmm. even though it was my absolute passion and it was kind of like my mistress you know and um and then by chance I fall into gaming because I had to be the one to do the labyrinth board game they're probably better people for the job but you know screw them I had to do it I don't <laughs> want them to do it you know? and um and then so now I'm working in games and and um you know I it was a learning experience for me um um you know uh I'd never what had actually happened um oh god alicia is probably going to watch this because he'll watch your channel because it's a great channel th that relates to his interests but um i you know i said i've got to do the models for it and he's like great i've got this weird sculptor doing the models for it and then um i sculpted hoggle this big as a proof of concept and the hoggle came out great and i did it in like two and a half days and um and, and I showed him, he's like, that's a great hoggle. And I'm like, yeah, man, it took me two and a half days. And, and, um, and he's like, yeah, let's do the rest. And um, all of the rest, I, I could sculpt hoggle in my sleep. I've been drawing him since I was five. I've already, I've already sculpted him like four times. I knocked hoggle out, out, you know. And then the rest, it's like, what am I doing? You know, and I, I, had, <laughs> I had to deliver these miniatures that were far beyond my means. And I did. I mean, Didymus is great. Ludo came out great. But I had to um, kind of out of my paycheck um, pay Jane Winley and Jamie Biswarek to help me get the likenesses of Sarah and Jareth because I'd never sculpted a human before because they're so boring. I see them every day. <laughs> you know, um, why do I? Like, and not only had I not sculpted people before, but literally the two most attractive people that had ever been born on planet Earth. <laughs> I've got to sculpt that perfection this big. <laughs> And it's like, okay, so like, um, why does why does Jennifer why does my Sarah look like Rowan Atkinson? You know, <laughs> it's like, um, look, why does why does my David Bowie look like Pete Pothelswaite? This is a nightmare, you know. And and um, and so I brought some people in to help me with that, and so I didn't really make any money on on some of those sculpts, but that was irrelevant. I I you know, um, jokes on Alessio, he didn't need to pay me at all. I would have done it for free. Um, but I you know, and I, and it was great. You know, sharing ideas with him, and, and um, he was he was very free to just let me do do the thing. And um, but you know, again, um, I I just there's an alternate, you know, Rick and Morty timeline universe out there, um, where like Alessio made like the Mordheim meets Battles for Middle Earth version of labyrinth the the tabletop game you know mm. but again like like how naive of me was it to expect like a warhammer cursed city box for an 80s nostalgia movie that has a limited cult following <laughs> do you know what i mean yeah. would have bankrupted river horse and 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 he he knew exactly what his, he was he was doing and he's made um you know a, a, a well-selling accessible game for for labyrinth fans which is exactly what he meant to do, and exactly what he what what he did. Yeah. Um, and I'll uh, and one day, I mean, I'm just ticking away and ticking away at making this labyrinth in my studio. But um, uh, and then obviously that followed on to doing the Dark Crystal game for for them for them as well. And, and um, and so by that stage, what it, this is, and so this is how I got into tabletop gaming, right? Hmm. I don't know if how long has this even gone for so far. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> well well, I mean, we've been talking for a while. I, I was curious just about if you can sort of encapsulate the gloaming as a setting. Like you, you mentioned that it's inspired by European folklore, but what was the sort of what's the pitch, I guess, for the gloaming as a as a place to play games? So okay, yeah, totally. So so um so after the journey through tabletop gaming, um, which we'll get back to in a sec, but um it came 
full circle into realizing that the the gloaming was this was this asset I had. Um, the things I loved most about tabletop gaming, uh, Hero Quest, Dungeons and Dragons, kit bashing Warhammer to tell my own stories. I love I loved the narrative you can put into your own games of Warhammer and how they started expressing it through like narrative play situations and amendments and manuals and all that stuff. And um and I just started getting excited over like the I've created the, the gloaming is like you, you could almost consider it like one of the realms in, in Warhammer in the sense that like for me personally it's a place that I want to visit and and explore um so the, the gloaming is 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 like the fairy world um but I, I hate using the word fairy you know because it, it, it's not cute ballerinas with butterfly wings but mm. I just more like the fae world do you know what I mean but from medieval folklore the, the, basically the same one that Rip Van Winkle steps into spends an hour there comes out he's 60 years old and everyone's grown up you know the dangerous fairy fairy world the the um the riddle telling baby stealing changeling world right and originally what the gloaming started off for me it was um it was a conceptual design brief to make me excited and grow as an artist. And I wanted, in the same way that the folklore, how it was depicted in Jim Henson's Storyteller wasn't cutesy poo fairy stuff, like the gruffle hog is, is terrifying. Um, I, I wanted this dark, creepy, um, like, you know, kind of, I, I always wanted to, to believe that the fairy world was real. I, ne I never, have but like the believing in it is 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 a huge just the fun of it you know and what if it what if it did exist what if what if david attenborough instead of going to africa went to the fairy world the fairy world for me is called the gloaming because it just became my favorite word the gloaming as a word means that like that little period of kind of golden light you get between evening and and you know and dusk right um but uh, in medieval folklore that is the time when the the veil between worlds is the thinnest and you're most likely to see an, a gnome or a puka or what whatever a chloricum across the field well that that would be the time when you check in on your baby and it's not getting swapped by a changeling or or, or something like that and so it's like wow my favorite word also means my favorite thing you know the, the chance when the goblins might come and take me away you know and um and so i just decided I needed, you know, I needed a Middle Earth or a Narnia or a Westeros, and so I just used the gloaming. I think even it may have just started as a placeholder, but I used it for too long, and it's definitely the gloaming now, you know. <laughs> um, um, and so, you know, it is the it's the Fey realm, and but I, I took I took it as seriously as humanly possible. An example of this is I start I did doing all these creatures, but I decided to do some gnomes, and so I did what what would what would a gnome look like to scottish folklore what would a gnome look like to british folklore what would a gnome look like to um the irish folklore and then I, because all folklore kind of just because of the way land masses work who occupied them and which cultures were actually documenting stories in written form um most of folklore comes from you know the eurocentric part of the globe obviously you know that's not to say that obviously African and Chinese and Japanese and and all sorts of other places that have wonderful mythologies, but I wanted as a New Zealander, our, our country is so young, um, but uh, but the uh, our native inhabitants are the Maori who have just the most outstanding folk as as interesting as, as any Eurocentric folklore, right? Um, and but I was so serious about the gloaming being in this kind of one Eurocentric place to make it more realistic. Um, I I stepped past that seriousness for, for one part because I, I just really felt compelled to design um, something from Māori folklore. And they, because they have this legend of the Patu Pararehi, who is the, who is a gnome who taught them how to weave flax. Mm. Um, and I'm like, oh, man, I want to design that. One of the gnomes is just going to be um, the New Zealand gnome. because I've done Scottish, Irish, uh, English and I have some kind of descendancy connection to that you know but um and I, I I'm not Maori m myself but I've grown up you know surrounded in the culture and you know getting taught the the language and New, New Zealand um 
I don't know if it it, it could do better, but it, it, it certainly does a lot of kind of keeping the culture alive and at least taught to school kids, you know? So, it was, you know, and it's an amazing culture. And so I wanted to express that. Um, and we, we have something here that's called like tapu, like because, because some, because basically like any colonized land, you know, the, the country got kind of stolen and reshaped around these people. Mm. And so they're very protective of their myths and, and mythology. And like, you know, it, it is frowned upon for just, you know, some some white person to come and re reappropriate it or misappropriate it, you know? Mm. So I felt very, I was aware that I was doing it out of a place of pure um, passion and interest and, and conceptual design fervor. Mm. And so I, so I started studying everything I could learn about the patuparehi so I could make the most perfect patuparehi. But to the Māori, their idea of something really strange and foreign and creepy in the woods turned out to be a blue-eyed, pale-skinned, blonde-haired little creature, right? And I felt, um, which is, which I think is fantastic, but I felt really awkward being um, some white dude making this Aryan little gnome and saying, that's the Māori gnome, you know? And mm. it just it didn't work for me at all. So I threw out all of, for every other gnome, I'm taking in as much as I can learn. But for this one, I designed like his, his ring became the muku which is their facial carvings and also i wanted him to predate um european um colonization and there were no mammals on new zealand you know so there'd be no wool from the introduction of sheep and no fur from the introduction of, of rabbits and stoats and everything so i made all of his costume out of like weave, weaving natural forest fibers and flaxes together and and everything on his person like jade stone everything was natural and indigenous to native New Zealand prior to the British conquest, you know? Hmm. And um, and then I displayed that sculpture in Gisborne where his myth originated and some of the Māori older, uh, elders came and saw it. And then I became the first and only um, non-Māori person to be invited to exhibit in the New Zealand Māori Art Expo because of it. And, and I just found that interesting because it came from a place of completely going against what the actual myth was to to more from my heart show what i would and, and for, as a what i would what i wanted to see basically as a conceptual mm. designer if i went to the movie of like the moldy mythology i would have been disappointed to have seen a blonde haired white skinned blue eyed gnome yeah i, I, I want to see this dark crystally muku flax sort of creature so that's what i made and yeah. with jade's own eyes and that's what they responded to but that same conceptual design aesthetic i've put into and seriousness um i've put into um every creature in the gloaming um because i and, and what's what's so exciting about how um for some time now and for some time to come i'm developing this into uh, a, a fifth edition dungeons and dragons um explore first right now we're working on the monster manual that takes every sculpt i've done and and makes it a playable monster matt roush is doing the most amazing job we've got a whole team of people making this book um but like for me like even the most highest produced monster manuals um you know like every only every third or fourth character has an illustration and there's many different artists providing that illustration sometimes they're amazing sometimes they're only quite good sometimes they're just black and white sketches you know what i mean but i, I wanted to produce this monster manual that like feels like you're stepping into the world of the gloaming as much as it feels like you're stepping into the world of Thra when you watch Labyrinth or you've been abducted by the Goblin King when you, oh, sorry, Dark Crystal, or you've been abducted by Goblin King when you watch Labyrinth, you know? I want, I want, I want to create a monster manual that has the same quality of, of design um, and world building that um, me and my f fellow designers at Weta Workshop put into middle earth or narnia or the spielberg's bfg um uh everything i learned in almost two decades of film i want to give that into a monster manual because D, D is as rich and exciting as and as important to me as every bit as important as when i was designing a troll for del toro a dwarf for peter jackson or um a a, a giant for Spielberg um but 
I think even more so in the gloaming because I'm not working to anyone's brief but mine. There's no script and there's no director and there's no design room manager. It's just me completing the purest sense of my vision of, of everything I've learned and absorbed and adapted and been inspired by in my time as a, a passionate film watcher and a passionate film designer and also as as a gamer um you know like i i'm so visually orientated that it's um i i, I often find it quite disappointed disappointing the lack of visual illustration given to some dungeons and dragons books mm -hmm. and content and, like as someone who now has the companies and you know sees the statements and the bills and and knows what it means to pay an artist what they're worth to create the art i utterly understand it and i don't devalue it and i i i don't think harshly about the decisions behind not being able to illustrate every single character hmm. but because i'm because the gloaming monster manual project is um is paying the right people to help put together the book and i'm completely working on sweat equity and and using a resource that's almost been 20 years in the making hmm. like i'm only able to create my dream monster manual and my dream campaign to follow it up with to the spielbergian level that i unfairly have inside my head that i demand of my gaming media because I've given 20 years of my life and hundreds of thousands of dollars probably by now from the various sources that have fueled the gloaming. Yeah. That's how much I've been able to, um, and again, because 17 years of the work on the gloaming monster manual, um, and the same way that these book publishers were like, we, your book's too full on to sell as a book. Like, I, well, I wasn't thinking about making a book, you know, like, if if I started today making a monster manual, if any, if, if, I think of Games Workshop with all their money and, and time and resources and the world's greatest artists, I think if they today sat down and said, let's make this monster manual, no one in that board meeting would agree to it to the because I, I've sculpted every character, some cases life size. I mean, the dragons of a, a 15 foot sculpture, you know, I photographed them in real backgrounds, um, that it's 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 taken two decades of my life to produce this monster manual before i even knew it was going to be this monster manual but yeah. it, it's shaping up to be the dream gaming asset that i've always wanted um and it felt like every twist and turn and disappointment and and exceptional exciting achievement and everything every step of my creative life from watching the labyrinth when i was five to working on blockbuster movies to working on the labyrinth board game uh every step has taken me towards making like this perfect like it was it was it was always meant to be a dungeons and dragons resource of monumental proportions i just didn't know it until the last couple of years yeah you know and um and that's that's really ex and, and what's that's so exciting for me because um, I had so much to tell in this. The, I, I've written it as three novels. Those three novels may never be seen, mm. but the fact that I spent those years writing those three novels, I I I have been to the gloaming. I know this world back to front. So when I'm working working with Matt Rauscher and he asks a question, the answer is like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if this or maybe I don't know what works best. It's like, oh, this happens, you know. And, and because, like for example, like if you were to role play in Middle Earth like you could role play in middle earth so much better than if i said right you're on planet zebel bronx and the flephtatoids are coming at you with spatula cods you're like, okay well, great i guess you know but in middle earth you could walk me around that map i know you jordan sorcery could take me like if i said if i was in if i was in brie and i said um i want to get my party to rohan you would know how many days and which it's going to take the, the the questing party to get there and you'd know what kind of characters i'd probably meet along the way and which lanes to avoid because you know like the rest of us know middle earth so conceptually well and for me i, I wanted to create like 
and it, it, like to, for some for one person like me you know some high school dropout to go oh I, you know like here's the bar i'll set for myself i want to make like a token level universe to the visual level of uh the dark crystal um you know like it, it's so utterly ridiculous and so like i said like with the naivety thing and i'm uh, by, by the way i'm not saying it's reached those ridiculous you know but you shoot for the star shoot for the moon and full hit the stars or whatever you know what i mean yeah i was like i'm not i'm not saying i'm not comparing myself in any way but i'm just saying those are the those are the really unrealistic um goals i set for myself and it's taken 17 years to get to to a point where my my body of work and my vision has reached the uncontrollable stupid naive kid in the head <laughs> you see well, you and, say, and i can say with, sorry. you say that these are unrealistic you say that this is you know a, a naivety but before they were spielberg and tolkien they were just kids and men who wanted to tell stories and create worlds which is exactly what you're wanting to do right and what i've well, seen they, they is inspired by incredible yeah oh, thank you so much yeah well yeah it's um it's just it's the place I want to, it's the place I want to visit. I mean, in, in some ways, I've always seen it like, you know, there's the Dark Crystal, then there was the Labyrinth, and then Jim Henson passed on. Um, and I always feel like it's like, there's this thing we didn't get, you know, and, and so that was the unrealistic um, uh, precedent I set for myself. I kind of wanted it just for me, like, because I was never going to work on a Jim Henson movie. So I just made myself one to work on. <laughs> um no um which is it seems it seems so ridiculous now that i've been doing it for 17 years and i look back on what i've done it's like it's i never would have i'm so glad i never knew how ridiculous <laughs> it was or that i was a much more ridiculous person at 20 when i started but um <laughs> yeah so so but that's that's what i mean about how, how exciting um tabletop like tabletop gaming for me was an absolute revelation in the sense like when i so how i fell into it as well i mean like like i was working on labyrinth and dark crystal because i had to but then after that um weta started this board game division weta workshop and they started um producing this game they produced this game gkr and then they um they made this road trip around america to promote it and one of the designers dropped out last minute and I was kind of the only person around Weta that was, you know, board game mad and everyone knew I was working on the elaborate board game and stuff. And um, you could push me in front of people and I could talk. And so they go, Johnny, do you want to go on this um, 10 day road trip, um, visit board games around America, board game shops around America, and then end up at Gen Con? And I'm like, yeah, that sounds amazing, <laughs> right? And so I went on that trip. And that, after that trip, I was like, I'm, I'm a board gamer, you know, like, I've I've had my film experience that was great. I like I'm never going to feel feel about film. I can't think of a movie um unless Guillermo del Toro directs The Island of Dr. Moreau starring Ian McShane and Gary Oldman. Like I cannot think of a movie that is going to excite me more than board games. Like the 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 last game I played in the whole full campaign of Star Wars Imperial Assault, right? You would have thought um, real men had just watched their rugby team win the World Cup, you know. <laughs> you know, but me and my man children friends was just, I literally went to a galaxy far, far away. I I don't get that experience in a movie, and, and so um, me and this guy I was on this road trip on after ten days of like discussing board games and what we would do differently and how we would do it and um, what our dreams were and stuff. By the end of that trip, we're like, you want to start a board gaming company, and then we did. Um, because that's what crazy dreamers do. And we started Tabletop Troubadour Games. And Tabletop Troubadour Games was meant to be a board game company because I developed all of these um assets. It wasn't just the gloaming. I I'm talking about intellectual property assets. I developed this world of the gloaming and this world called um preschool pirates and the wandering woods and all these things. And um we were so all of the money and years you would pay to get art for a board game i had about five board games fully illustrated in the bank 
And then so we, we're going to look for some developers. And Ike became my business partner. Um, I started making these modular um, gaming, medieval fantasy modular village gaming terrain just for myself. Because like um, I started looking at some tabletop world buildings and I was like, these are amazing. I'm just, and so I add to cart, add to cart, add to cart, add to cart. And then the bill came to, you know, like $1,600 or something, which was worth every penny. Um, there's not, there might only be a couple of buildings, but like they're, they're, they demand that price because they're little works of art. You know what I mean? And, and like, I wasn't turned off. I, I didn't think I was getting ripped off. I just felt, hmm, $1,600. If I put that towards molding silicon costs, I could just sculpt my own, right? 40 grand later. <laughs> um I, I i start i start sculpting um hagglethorne hollow it wasn't called that at the time but i start making the and, and so and, and because all and like especially with with games workshop and this isn't a complaint because i understand it from a managerial point of view i always found their walls like so thin but you've got to get models on them they've got to produce it in plastic they've got to get it on a box there's, there's cost there's weight I mean, the, the terrain always feels a bit small because if they made it any bigger, it would like completely shrink down the audience of the people that would buy it. So why produce it in the first place? You know, there's so many factors to take into consideration when you're mass producing a product, right? But I was sculpting these buildings just for me. So the walls are massively thick and they're tilting and they're crumbling. And I knew what I could get away with molding it and casting it in silicon because I've molded, casted in silicon and, and produced like 50 life-size fairy fantasy creatures right so i knew what i could get away with with these buildings and it was only ever going to be for my personal gaming table and so i'm making all these things and then ike sees these and it's like well we should um put these online i'm like nobody's gonna want these nobody wants this um but anyway long story short everyone knows we, we turned it into agathon hollow and the reason it was so popular is because like i had created something for myself because i couldn't find it online it's like mm. buildings the walls are never thick enough and i was like well you know what I've, if, I've, if I'm going to spend all the time making and casting and painting this base and, and then I build the roof to take off, off it, I've done this tile roof, but I could make a completely different building out of thatch or something that could go on this. Mm. And then I thought, actually, I could make a dungeon under it. And now I've got six different options. And so like, this dungeon's cool. That's halfway towards a ruined castle. So I made a ruined castle in there. It's like, well, this works with that. And I start doing this kind of thing. It's like, well, <laughs> And then I, I, I was like, okay, that's enough. Stop. Let's just get that online. I'm like, okay, but no, no one's going to want it. And then um, for us, anyway, for a two-man thing, Hagglethorn Hollow like exploded. And then we, we, Ike just wanted to put, you know, to make a little money on a, a quality product that we could use to fund our, our board game visions. Hmm. But then we just became a full-on terrain-making company um, because we had to meet the demands of this runaway success, which um, became like basically a three-year full-time job for me, which which again put a three-year gap between me kind of fulfilling what the gloaming could be. Mm. Um, but it had my head in tabletop gaming for for, for three years, and um, I mean, and everything was going everything was going to be perfect and delivered on time, and then COVID hit, right? Um, so you know most most of the success of Agwith and Hollow really just went into um absolutely delivering on on the promise that we made and 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 we did um and but it, it just it took it took so long and and um to, but just because of uh all of like the the crushing things that covid put on art directing a product globally hmm. um um just, just changing a decision on something that might take eight days could suddenly take eight weeks and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And but um, at the end of the day, um, uh, I'm I'll always be um, you know quite proud of the fact that two guys pulled it off and completed this impossible promise of of this modular gaming village on the table and you see people's photos of it and people's experience of of just opening a box and having a full medieval village on their table and um it looks impressive when people have it on the table because again um it's the craziness behind it is um 
if I'd started making Hagglethorn Hollow as a product, it wouldn't look anything like Hagglethorn Hollow. You know, it would be smaller, it would be thinner, it would be much more easy to produce and everything. All I did was make my dream fantasy village. And my dream fantasy village needs to look as good as the time they let me walk around the set of Lake Town, right? Because that <laughs> reawoke gaming. You know what I mean? I want, it to, I want you to get your iPhone out, take a shot of it, and be like, which Peter Jackson movie is that from? You know what I mean? Like, um, that's and that's the same aesthetic I, I, I put into the campaigns I art direct through printable scenery now. Hmm. And, and, um, and, and so, yeah, and so um, with my head so full and so just 24 seven omnipresent in the tabletop gaming world, um, the, the gloaming that was going to be like a board game with miniatures, because I've always been obsessed with miniatures, always have been, um, since I saw HeroQuest at six or whatever. You know, just absolutely. I, and th making my own miniatures now is is just a, a dream come true. You know, and um, and anyway, so I wanted a board. I wanted kind of like a cool mini or not sort of a board game, hmm. kind of maybe like Zombicide meets Hero Quest kind of thing for the gloaming. But then um, we you know we just made a promise. We we wouldn't start developing any board games until everybody had Hagwith on Hollow and and just COVID make that take forever and so the gloaming kind of just sat somewhere but by by that stage um i developed this relationship with um printable scenery who were making hagwith and holland printable scenery um and then they asked me to to come on board and start conceptually designing all of their campaigns um and i just learned it was a whole new world for me because um like in hagwith hollow um, I can't make the beams sticking out too much because they're going to break off. And the beams had to be this amount of thickness um, to come out of the mold. Mm. Um, so from Hollow, I, I love it. It looks great. I am proud of it. It, it. But, you know, it's quite chunky. I love the chunkiness because I, for me, I call it, I call it Disney Q aesthetic. Like mm. for someone like me, I love standing in the queue at Disneyland because how they've sculpted the interior of Indiana Jones's ride or like Pinocchio's house. It looks like I've been shrunk down. It, it looks like it, I'm, I'm a gaming miniature walking around Warhammer terrain. Right. <laughs> and so I wanted to, and so I call it Disney Q aesthetic. And I, so I got all the Disney Q aesthetic and in, into, um, into Hagglethorn hollow. Um, but there's a video on YouTube that I did like, the the fisherman's hut has this little dragon's uh crest at the top of it it took me three days to sculpt it this big all of the stretch goals i unlocked that are statues of like they, they come out this big the, this <laughs> big statues that you can hang with on hollow they took a week and a half each to sculpt because i sculpted them all this big right because i wanted to get that detail in because i'm not a digital sculptor and then they got scanned and then 3d printed and molded and all this stuff um and, but with and, and so that's how much it takes to, but with, with, with printable scenery, I can draw and, and art direct sculpts, sculptors to put all of, uh, all of those, um, all of those sculptures and, and, and details and, and like, you know, Hagglethorn Hollow doesn't have any little nails. You might see those in tabletop world or, 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 ga or games workshop stuff, but mm. I can, if I, if I want nails, I art direct nails into it and stuff. So if, with what I learned, from hand sculpting a full working medieval village, um, which which is has been absolutely crucial to now draw, design, foam card, art direct digital models to to bring what I could do hand sculpting, because I demand that same level in the printable scenery that I art direct. Hmm. Um, but while also fighting the parameters of what really is feasible to print, hmm. um, Matt who who um, started and run printable scenery has made this amazing company um he he um you know he he's in this situation where um he's hired me to be this uh, uh you know this, what, this is amazing this will be amazing and um matt's the closest person i've ever met to being like richard taylor in the same sense that's like yes rip into it that'd be great you know and, um, he, he and he gets really excited about my ideas and I get it, and he's got great ideas too. And we've learned the hard way a couple of times that um, uh, the two of us left together can become our own worst enemy <laughs> because um, we we we'll, we just want to create 
this utterly unachievable thing but it's that's actually a really amazing boon to what the company now pro- delivers and provides because we'll push something as far as it can go and go okay how can we make that what do we do mm. um we don't want to make concessions but if we do make a concession what could it be but also how could that step backwards make the model better rather than just be a step backwards yeah and so it's just these uh, we we just go nuts sometimes we we, we have some <laughs> bad days but the, the bad day is always about how do we make the absolute best model and and i'll stand i'll stand by it like i you know what printable scenery have been doing like you do compare it to some other printable scenery and you can at first glance there's some campaigns that look great but they're very simple square modeled stuff and conceptually they're not really doing anything new that hasn't been done before and so for what happens with printable scenery because like i i'm not just a designer like anything i design in a printable scenery campaign i get on my table Mm. um right um so i'm really designing for me but fortunately me is someone who wants really playable terrain that i can use through across multiple games like and and not not just like genres like some this i've made printable scenery that i use as much in the warhammer world as i do in the star wars world because it's that kind of compatible and i designed it specifically for that because i spend a lot of time painting and then elaborating on my printable scenery so a bit of work than more than one time on the table you know what i mean (laughs) Um, so i think in the same way that hagglethorn hollow found its audience because i'd created something that didn't exist in the market because it didn't exist in the market and i needed it so i made it before i thought it would be a product Mm. and that's why i found its audience with printable scenery i'm doing the same and i'm pushing it farther than what i could do with hagglethorn hollow because i have the means to detail things more beautifully um through art directing fantastic digital artists Hmm. and then i've got a brain genius like matt barker who um is not telling me limitations but reminding me you know (laughs) we have these limitations our customers still have to to print this but then rather than you know go you're doing it wrong it just creates these opportunities for matt and i to um to have fun a lot of the time um challenge problem solving the challenge and not just how do we fix it but how do we make the fix make the model better than before we had the problem yeah and i I, they're they're not huge problems and and um but but the the only the problem isn't printable scenery the problem is my imagination and what (laughs) i want to do well i was going to say that i took a look at uh one of your i don't know if it was a printable scenery piece but it's it's a giant turtle and then you can put on it's the printable back, scenery it's pretty right and then you've got the shell and it's totally modular so you can put the shell on the back or you can put a howder on top and then you've got different levels to the howder that you can take on and, and put on and, and take off it's i i can't even conceive of how you would actually like dr- imagine that uh, like physically do you because you do you use like acetates to draw the different levels or how do you how do you create that level of modularity in a design that's so complex? Um, do do you like edit and pause these videos? Because I can go grab sure. it. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can do that. Yeah, okay, one second. I'll be right back. So, ah, oh, okay. It, it comes with a spare shell, but I left the shell in my studio. But so, what can happen is, oh, he's better looking this way. So, you can have just just the shell, right? And that that shell can be in the water, or the shell can be this boat. So you could be playing a game of D and D, and you've got these guys on a raft, or they go to the shell like it's an island, and then but then um you know it can lift up. And, um the 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 model now has has uh, nubs that secure it, but so then it's this this big guy here, and so um. You know, like I, I collect the new Games Workshop Swampy Orcs, um, right. and and so this works for 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 that, but it also um, works for D and D, and obviously it's 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 going to be a big feature of the story of the gloaming. But then, so these are all the different features you've got. You can have this little kind of Oregon Trail looking thing, <laughs> or you can um, you can. Uh, Hold on, which way does this go? Yeah, that, that can go there. And then that, that can go on there as well like that. 
or you could just get silly with it and put that on there. <laughs> you can you can have a flat a flat roof like that. Um, or which way go? this goes this way. Yeah, on there, and then this can go up on there, and then I've made all these designed. <laughs> This is this is like a a resin print. That's one print. Um, right. Wow. I I love scatter terrain and I love clutter. Anyway, so that's like the full Vascalian thing there. Um, <laughs> you, you like, can how, print a bunch of those. Just make it a goblin camp or whatever. But um. So how do yeah, you so, how do you design that then? So because you, you've got so many different levels, is it just about? I mean, I guess it's just making sure that there's certain points that are always the contact between levels and stuff. That's, that's what's really cool about printable scenery is is that um like they because they make sure everything has to print easily for the customer hmm. um um and they they want to the, the more the company grows the more it wants to do more than what every printable scenery company does which is quite squarish boxes accessible buildings which absolutely have their place and and that's where everyone started and everything but um you know technology moves forwards and we want to just keep pushing how good printable scenery can be you know and we're going to get it to i think it's at like a games workshop level now um and uh but but they have lots of test prints and i always you know and they just stack up and stack up and the studio is only so big and um and i'm like as a kit basher uh and a model maker you know uh yeah i just give it to me you know and, and so first of all we the fast calling design already existed um and we've had a printable scenery we've had with for a long time we've been slowly building up what gloaming things are released in printable scenery campaigns because we can't just do like a whole here's the whole world of the gloaming printable scenery campaign because it's like it's not people's problem right now to understand exactly what the gloaming is and and just jump on board because it's not like a middle earth ip as such yet because we're about to everything you need to know about the gloaming we're, we're working on to release to the world next year with this monster manual and then the follow-up campaign hmm. um because it's that much work has been put into it that it will be that kind of fleshed out everything is visually represent you know and so um the the doing a campaign about the swamps being so naturalistic and everything was a great way to start including some gloaming creature models hmm. that we could um we could make accessible for the gaming module and the fast um was one i really pushed for because i thought it it would really feed well into um the printable scenery side of things not that that whole thing isn't resin that's um from the fdm printer you know and that's how good they are now that the detail is is just fantastic and I, I i like i love the idea of a piece of living terrain gaming terrain so like we, when gaming terrain can have its own rules you know is one thing but when it can actually move across the tabletop and affect a game you know and, and nothing's better than a, a giant fast Kellyan turtle creature and um, that's always inspired me since the poem Faskelion and the Adventures of Tom Bombadil, um, Tolkien book of collected poems and short stories. Um, no, ta sorry, Tales from a Perilous Realm, of which the Tom Bombadil story is in, but there's a poem not related to Tom Bombadil called Faskelion. I was like, look, there goes Faskelion, an island good to land upon sort of thing. And it's about these sailors that go land on an island, but it turns out it's this giant Faskelion. And I think somewhere along the line, when I developed the gloaming, I thought of it as a turtle, which may have lent back into never ending story vibes as a kid. Cause again, any movie with a creature in it was my jam. Anyway, so I, so we had the turtle, we had the fast Kelly design and then um, I designed, I basically just drew it in pencil that the, the whole thing you saw there. Right. But when we started printing it, I found I, I could, uh, holding it physically from from the test prints 
and you know the test prints are like okay this is good but we need to make this angle more 45 degrees so there's no stringing so it, and we don't need supports when we print it and whatever issues arise out okay that's cool we'll redesign this that now it, now it prints and the design still looks good awesome but with these test prints i was able to hacksaw this and cut that and re-sculpt that and look at the pieces differently and realize hey there's actually a couple more options the the, the sculpting's already been done the model's already been made but if we separate it here, tilt this bit here, if we just cut this bit off this, add it to this bit, and um, with a, with one more beam here or whatever, I, I've got like two whole more options. I can um, reconfigure this thing um, and we've just increased the the playability. And they're like, okay, sure. And, and, and so then I, through learning that, through tactically holding and playing with this monster, I can then go back and art direct the team to, and, um, and that's just going to be a surprise for people that have already backed it because we didn't show that on the Kickstarter because we hadn't learned it by then. You know, I the, on the Kickstarter, that whole thing was some pencil illustrations. Right. And then once, but, we, you know, printable is great. It's, it is the true definition of what Kickstarters are meant to be. Like the, the, the more people that come and back um, our Kickstarters, whether it's printable scenery or the new um, monster manual, uh, you know you, you genuinely are actively and personally helping make the product better and bigger mm. i like outside of tabletop gaming i'm not like say if you made like a new camera tripod or something and put it on kickstarter i'm not sure how more funding could make that camera tripod better than it already is you know what i mean but like yeah. board games like you know I, I love back in a cool mini or not board game and checking in each new morning going, oh, I've unlocked that character. I, you know, they're great games, but I can't say I even play them that much. I just love all the minis. Like mm. for me, like the, the Zombicide Black Play games, I, I, I have got to the table a few times and loved every minute of it, but I, I'm collecting those for NPCs for my Dungeons and Dragons games. <laughs> that minute is great. That minute is great. Anyway, so like, Kickstarter, especially with um, printable scenery, um, like every stretch goal unlocked. I mean, that's that's all pouring money back into the product. Hmm. It's not going in an Uncle Scrooge money bank tower that we swim in. You know, it's just like, okay, great that we can make more models and more models. And you see the amount of stretch goals that we unlock and 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 deliver. Um, and um, yeah, it's a stressful, busy time for me, but I. I I love um, getting in more and more opportunities to design something that's um, going to end up on my tabletop um, because, again, I know if I'm designing it for me, it's going to appeal to people because, mm -hmm. because like, I'm, on, I'm trying to design the best tabletop gaming terrain because that's what I demand for my table. Because I'm yeah. very, very, very picky. I won't ever play with an unpainted miniature or an unfinished piece of terrain. Like I, my table needs to look like a film set before a dice rolls, you know. And 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 the level of quality I demand from the actual finished product that comes out of um, printable scenery is is really high, which is great because I've teamed up with the right people because that they, they know what they're doing. And it's just it's been a it's been a real thrill to um to i i found it the most uh creatively the most creatively freeing um design job i've ever had in my life um working with with printable scenery and um being able to express my world building ideas um uh, through that and and then um uh so at, at the moment because i'm now you know i work for printable scenery and i'm I'm building this monster menu so much um our house has a um a studio at the back which i would i'll show you but we don't get wi-fi out there you know because it's down the garden <laughs> um and you'll cut it but um I, i've been for four years building this massive landscape but when i was so i, I just uh, i'm 39 but when i was 20 working on king kong i had this dream that one day I'll have I'll own a place where I have a room where I can permanently make my own like skull island landscape with this rock, and now I have it. And like I, 
I art directed um, the dinosaur fantasy Dungeons and Dragons thing through Weta. Um, the reason the reason why I made it Dinosaurs Dungeons and Dragons is so they could produce the same rock that they hadn't done since King Kong. So I could get some of that rock to make this landscape for the gloaming. Um, you know, <laughs> they'd be, they, I, I wasn't cheating anybody because they got a great IP, right? And then I got the great rock that I desperately needed to fulfill my vision. And so I've been building that landscape. And at the moment, um, I, I started a Patreon um, where because I build all of these things all week long, right? And now I document the process and make it into tutorials on my Patreon. And it's this lovely, warm, welcoming little group of fellow makers that um, share their stuff and I, and you know, they get a kick out of what I'm doing. And um, it's it's doing well enough now that, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's just, it's a small project for me that I enjoy sharing with people, but rather than, rather than just put the, money on groceries or power bills or whatever um i i'm i've saved up enough of it that i'm now one day a week paying um a friend of mine to be my apprentice to help me um basically make more content for the patreon so it, it's a snake eating its tail fulfilling that that promise to people but so so i can um so i can still keep spinning the stupid amount of plates i'm spinning but have truly like a dedicated day where um the port city that i'm building in my studio um which has all sorts of fantastical elements from a woodwose forest to a crumbling port to a portal cave and just kind of a dwarven mine system and a shipping lane and all this stuff um i'm four years into the build and i'm probably a year away from finishing it um so now today he was helping me just paint branches on trees um but so i'm now able to fuel that investment from people back into um uh the terrain making content that i've really uh been enjoying uh giving people you know and and um i just uh i uh, one of the last things i what, what was cool about it is um when i first did my my video with adam savage with the the whole landscape um on tested so many comments were like how did you make those trees how did how, how did you make those trees and i never felt like i could tell people about it because i made those trees um by collecting off-cut foliage snippets from the miniatures department of king kong 20 years ago um and they no longer produce that product i've looked everywhere for years over it and you can't find it anywhere um and then i had to make it out of woodland scenics and stuff like that like um, I could never sell them. They'd be worth like a thousand dollars a tree, and even then, I'd be like out of pocket. You know what I mean? And it's like, so I'm not, I'm not going to be going. It's like, here's how I do it. You can't. So I just, I thought, why bother? But so recently, um, on my uh, Patreon, one of my patrons um spent a long time researching and looking and looking, and he's found uh, an equivalent product that now we're um we're workshopping into making a commercial viable product for people to finally be able to make trees the same way i did at test from the tester videos um but so anyone everyone will be able to do it but at a, like a viable cost yeah and not this cringingly stupid what was i thinking johnny cost you know <laughs> um and, and so i just used some of that product that we've been developing to um I took a whole bunch of test prints from some of the gloaming trees and made like these towering Dagobah trees. Cause I'm starting Dagobah is one of the last planets I haven't tackled from the original trilogy for my <laughs> uh, lead, Legion setups. And then once I finish that, all I've got to make is Jabba's palace and, and I'll be at no more Star Wars. But um, <laughs> you saved the top one for make... last there as well. Yeah, I know. But I mean, unless they make a, oh, I, I tell you what, the, the one thing about, more recent star wars content is even even if the films or the shows aren't that great and some of them are amazing but even even the bad ones the the one thing that gets better and better and better with star wars are the sets hmm. they're just glorious like um i remember seeing rogue one and when they go to Jeddah, it was like how how george first name basis um how how, how george would have um done 
Tatooine if he had the budget. Mm. And it's like Jeddah, Jeddah absolutely warped my mind. See, that, that's another person that just came through with her randomly one day. You're working at your desk, and you turn around and it's like, mm, that's, that's interesting. There you go. Bye. Mm. <laughs> that was George Lucas. What do you do? That stuff happens all the time. Anyway, yes. So, um, so that yeah, that is the full five hour story of how I went right. from watching liberal to making tabletop gaming terrain. And it's an amazing story, Johnny. So, yeah, I mean, you mentioned just whilst you were talking there, you mentioned that the gloaming, the the campaign setting, and the the monster manual, they're coming to Kickstarter next year. Is that the plan? Yeah, we're starting with the the monster manual, and, and the monster manual will have um. I, I I think it's getting past the point of being able to call it a one shot, but I don't know. I don't know how much I can say, but um, the the monster manual is designed so you can plug any of these. Um, I, I'm not boasting when I say amazing because of the work Matt Roush has done creating the stats for them and everything. Like it's these amazing characters you can plug into any of your existing campaigns if you've been playing for six or 10 years, you know what I mean? It's just this real asset of fantastic creatures that you won't have already, but um, there's also um, going to be your first kind of introduction into the gloaming and how you play there, what what you can expect there. And so if you've, you the, the monster manual itself, you can play kind of like, you know, a full, full D D with it's not just monster stats there's mm. the there's a campaign element in it as well um which is the kind of introductory um kind of teases the wrong word because it's 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 good teasing sounds mean it, it's, it's more <laughs> of an exciting whatever it's it's your, it's your first taste of of um what's to come in the um the, the campaign book which the um monster manual obviously complement perfectly but the campaign book um will also have a whole world of new characters um um due to the due to the nature of of the world we're creating mm. in the gloaming and outside of outside of the gloaming um and and it's going to be amazing what you're going to be able to do like with the taking the resources from the gloaming and and um what you do what you can build with them outside of that realm to help you to keep going and more or less exploiting that natural resource you know um uh, it's story-wise i mean working on it for a long time and it's really exciting how it's developing and the story is developed in a way that i couldn't be happier with but it could only have happened through letting go of it as a novel and exploring it as what can be an an active player participant role through Dungeons and Dragons and role playing, but um, so basically, like what would happen if a portal to the Fey world was opened, um, you know, in a medieval setting, hmm. and um, basically, it's kind of the fantasy version of Deadwood, whereas there's like a gold rush, and then um, it, it's nobody really owns the land. And so it's open to every scumbag willing to um, make make um, their claim through violence or any sort of means. And so very, very quickly, an entire settlement springs up around this resource. For Deadwood, it's gold. For the gloaming, it's this portal to another world, right? This other, But like Deadwood is very um, dangerous um, because of the, um, the Native uh, Americans who aren't very interested in letting these people take their land and and all sorts of um internal uh horrors of just human nature within the settlement you know um the, the gloaming is an incredibly dangerous place and so it's kind of like adventurers wanted um there's this settlement that is the the, the resources they're taking out of the gloaming they, they, they're getting shilled to the shops that have been established outside of this portal and the most rickety no building permit uh no nobody's calling any shots kind of a way so it, it's kind of like um it's deadwood meets district nine meets jim henson's the storyteller you know um with kind of an ankh morpork kind of vibe you know um and and because i'm really fascinated with like you you might be able to make your own trade and the resources but um 
you know, and you can build your you can build your standing up in the community. So you keep going in and out and and of the gloaming, but because it's this rich world full, it's not just the creatures, it's the ecology and and the medicinal properties, the or potion like qualities that can be distilled back in gloaming port once you've resourced these. But of course, the gloaming doesn't want you to resource these. You know, mm. it's um. Uh, it's going to fight back like the gloaming doesn't want to be colonized and it's it's full of um pretty tough scary creatures that in themselves are their own commodity like think of the fur trade in america and how like things like beavers and buffaloes were almost like hunted to extinction mm. because it's like hey i'll get myself some skin i'm making them money you know and and um and, and those people aren't necessarily bad people it's a tough times making a wage in a harsh world you know what i mean and what i re what the gloaming campaign is really going to do is is play with the ethics um of and the morality of the choices you make you know like D, &D is full of like you go in, into the layer there's a minotaur i killed the minotaur it's like well now you're going to learn about the uh the minotaur's family and what um what gap you've left in the gloaming from that and and what the consequences of that are going to be on a biggest perspective mm -hmm. and there's no longer this resource here and this person in town actually um breeds minotaurs blah 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 there aren't minotaurs in the gloaming i'm not c.s lewis <laughs> just picking anything from but uh, but i mean just for example you know what i mean it's like any like because the gloaming is so fleshed out and and i i know it so well um it it, it you know every every action is going to have a have a consequence but also um because i've de printable scenery and myself have developed such a it, it's going to be almost using every single piece of printable scenery terrain that i've helped develop with them in the last uh four years um so we're gonna um we're looking at you know creating a system where you can you know um have statistics for actual buildings um finished buildings and ruined buildings or perhaps you can even make your own base within the community um uh, uh, of of the gloaming port based on what you've traded and ha you, you can build your standing up through a building your own guild itself and and um and the different relationships between shop vendors and trading with that person might disqualify you to trade with this person mm. um and the, the, then the raids that are happening on gloaming port through bands of ogres and hobgoblins um coming from the other side that are trying to like you know just destroy the people that have been destroying them and you know and but what's really fascinating for me about gloaming port is um like wood woes that were kind of getting hunted to the point of extinction um they they are getting they're kind of getting an opportunity to um almost have like a a reservation um on the man side and and so it's basically work with our enemies or get killed and mm. and um so there's a there's a community of of uh you know the fairy folk that are also in, in the gloaming port and um which is fascinating and equally depressing and relevant to real world situations mm. but also creates all sorts of um interesting character dynamics and relationships but and it also creates um we, we've designed those people to be play new playable races that haven't been created before so you could play as wood woes or guardian gnomes and, and other things like that um but they're also you know they could be mercenaries for hire that you that you can your party can take into the gloaming and you'll be able to get better um, roles and statistics in terms of foraging and perception and, and stuff because they're natives to that land. And, mm. and so anything that can be think about as I thought about has been thunk about, you know, and <laughs> I, I, I just, uh, yeah, I, I can't, I can't be more excited about um, it's the world I've always wanted to visit. It's, it's a, it's the culmination of, of every, um, creative experience that has excited me and influenced me it's the culmination of what i learned from working from del toro spielberg peter jackson richard taylor especially um it, it's it's how labyrinth made me feel it's how terry pratchett's guards books made me feel why did they make me feel like that what is it what is it that i'm trying to encapsulate there why 
uh, why do I lose two hours sleep a night thinking about Mordheim when I should be getting rest? You know, what is it? What is it? Um, what is it about games workshop mythology um, that is as astounding to me as Tolkien's? You know, it, it because my job is a lot of it is autopilot for eight hours a day sometimes you know i'm lost in my head a lot and i use that time to think about why i love the things i do what that means to me and how i can i i kind of think of myself as like a a creative whiskey distillery or something you know like you you pour in the different things that catalyst and boil and brew up and all of all of that all of that stuff distills into little drops of this liquor you know Mm -hmm. and for me the gloaming is the creative liquor the creative spirit of labyrinth and mordheim and pratchett and gilliam and and tolkien and henson and phil tippett and and uh ralph Macquarie and and the vision of three 90s george lucas and uh and you know just ev- ev- everything is kind of boiled up in some Willy Wonka Gene Wilder machine that is just <laughs> dripping the gloaming monster manual, you know? Yeah. Um and and it's like Hagworth and Hollow. It's it's all for me. I'm creating the thing I absolutely want the most. And I assume and hope um because I'm a passionate gamer and know what I want to see through gaming, that it will find its audience in the same way that Hagglethorn did or some of my printable scenery stuff did or, you know. Yeah. yeah so it's um <laughs> I mean, it's just been a fun creative project i have no doubt at all that it will find that audience because it is it's incredible stuff what you've put together so far your passion is is so evident in how you talk about it and all of those influences have come together into something really really quite magical from from what i've seen so yeah i'm excited about it i'm really looking forward to seeing it fully fleshed out in the books and uh we'll definitely be keeping an eye on it i will put some links well, in the description below for for you as well so people can find you and find yeah. out more about it and and um and, and you know you're probably the only person that knows but you're you're in it you're you've featured in gloaming port we've made a miniature of you <laughs> um, i wasn't gonna say i didn't want to i didn't know if it was my place to. Well, we didn't discuss it but the thing and that's right here you can see that here <laughs> this is a miniature that's going to be in the next campaign. Um, uh, we've 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 made Jordan into, um, I guess you'd call it like a warrior priest in terms of a Mordheim warband. But um, I just, for, for me, like the because the gloaming is attracting all sorts of people and all sorts of adventurers, and um, I definitely think some of them would be like you're, you're going to get like the barbarian gruntos that just want to go in and and fight a dragon and kill an ogre but there's also going to be i really wanted to cater to the more like charles darwin like people and since you're like the law master of of all things board games and games workshops you've got like you've, you're holding a warhammer but you've you've also um got your book so you're like you're there learning everything about the gloaming and but you've got a warhammer because you really do need to have weapons on your own and and you've got a cat um familiar with you with you as well so it's just like everything about you captured in something as big as your thumb <laughs> <laughs> so another reason to be super excited about it yeah i'm, I'm very uh, looking forward I, to it. also i know he's going to be the perfect little uh ship captain for your marienburg war band as well <laughs> <Yeah>. so <laughs> we'll send you a painted copy um when he's off i'm excited printer. i cannot wait i really cannot wait i'm, I'm looking forward to it for that and awesome. for the entire thing, because I think it's going to be really fun. But yeah, cool. thank you, Johnny, for taking so much time out to talk to me. I, I've really enjoyed it. I think that's been fascinating. So thank you again. I feel like I've just run my mouth off the whole time. and not That's what it's about. Away. That's absolutely yeah, yeah. what it's about. <laughs> right. Well, it's been a pleasure. Um, I love I love your show. And um, I, I always check if there's another video when I log on to YouTube before I go to look for anything else because it's just always reliable, enjoyable content to get creative to. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Johnny, for spending the time to chat with me. I had an incredible time, just re- really, really good fun. Loads of awesome stuff. I Fantastic. Just <laughs> absolutely brilliant. I thought that was terrific. If you want to find out more about all of Johnny's work, I have put some links in the description below. Go and check out The Gloaming. 
as Johnny says, I will be appearing in miniature form next year in the gloaming. And I cannot wait to see how it turns out. I'm so, so excited about it. But all of Johnny's stuff is just amazing. Well worth whiling away a few hours just looking at his incredible work. It's it's great. It's just really, really good. If you enjoyed this conversation and want to see more of this kind of stuff here on the channel, do let me know in the comments below. And you can support me via Patreon, by a Ko-fi, or just by joining my Discord. And there's links for all of those in the description as well. Thank you again to Johnny. Thank you for watching. I am Jordan, and this is Jordan Sorcery.